Good morning, everybody. So uh, today is the third event of uh, this mangrove conference. Um, we have two good, very productive days of discussions, presentation, talks, deliberations on mangrove research, uh, covering both uh, blue carbon ecosystem. So uh, the first day theme was about <clears throat> mangrove as nature-based solution to climate change. And then yesterday we talked about mangroves for coastal resilience and biodiversity conservation, where we discussed about the, the values of mangrove, the ecosystem service they provide, the necessary function they, uh, they uh, provide to the communities living in the coastal areas by uh, <clears throat> serving as protection from extreme events, tsunamis and winds, uh, and a lot of uh, livelihood opportunities that mangrove ecosystems provide. Today, on 10th December, the third day of our event, the theme is Recent Advances in Mangrove Research and Future Perspectives. Here, we would like to see how all the scientific research uh, conducted both on biophysical aspects of mangrove as well as socioeconomic aspects of mangrove, how those that, that, that information, that knowledge can help in translating into better policy decisions, um, uh, better solutions to our challenges. And we, we will have uh, discussions also in terms of uh, some knowledge gaps still existing, uh, opportunities that exist, and we, where could we go further in terms of uh, the direction for research, in terms of collaborating between uh, various uh, partner organizations, researchers, practitioners. So today's uh, uh, theme is thought to be sort of bringing all of these pieces together and where we want to go from here. Uh, what are the, uh, the steps that we need to take? Who are the right partners? Who are the, the institutions uh, that could be instrumental in, in forging that path? So uh, with, with that idea in mind, uh, I'm very happy, happy to welcome all our guests, all our source people, and uh, a large number of audience and participants who have been with us throughout this two, last two days and joined us today as well from all over the world. So let me first start by uh, saying greetings to everyone. A very warm good morning, good afternoon, and a good evening to all of you who are here with us today in this uh, uh, conference. And uh, with that, I will uh, open the event by inviting our first uh, speaker, Dr. Rajshri Dasgupta, who will provide a uh, welcome address to everyone. So let me introduce uh, Dr. Dasgupta first. He is a senior policy researcher in the Integrated Sustainability Center of the Institute of Global Environmental Strategies. This is an environmental think, think tank based in Hayama, Japan. He is involved in multiple field-based action research related to landscape ecology, sustainability planning and worked extensively with foresters and mangrove communities in multiple South and Southeast Asian countries, particularly in India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and the Philippines. Dr. Dash Gupta has authored and co-authored nearly 50 peer-reviewed papers in various international journals and edited several books. His upcoming book titled Assessing, Mapping, and Modeling Mangrove Ecosystem Services is expected uh, in the mid 2022, so just a few more months. Dr. Dasgupta is serving as a lead author of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Assessment on Sustainable Use of Wild Species. And he's a contributing author for IPCC's Sixth Assessment Report, Working Group 2. He also serves as Visiting Associate Professor at Institute of Future Initiative, the University of Tokyo, and a guest lecturer at United Nations University, Tokyo. So we have, we are absolutely honored by your presence sir, here, and uh, I hand over floor to you to provide welcome address. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rupesh. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Very ah, clear. Thank you so much. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Nehru and Dr. Rupesh for inviting me to this August assembly and your nice and generous introduction. So distinguished professors, scientists, researchers, and practitioners, uh, namaskar and a very good morning, good afternoon 
and good evening to everyone who is joining to this virtual conference from across the world. So it is indeed my pleasure and privilege to share the stage with some of the best known mangrove experts that I know from India as well as abroad. Personally, I have learned a lot from, this, uh, from their research work as well as very engaging presentations since the last two days. Today's session focuses on the recent advancement in mangrove research and future directions, which is really important and timely topic, particularly for researchers like us. Uh, despite the time differences and other official obligations, I tried to follow most of the presentation over the past few two days. And I must say that some of the research, uh, uh, particularly by Professor Kathirasan and Professor Sauda Menidas was actually uh, well ahead of their time. In fact, if you see the concept of eco uh, which is going around uh, currently, uh, Professor Kathirasan's landmark paper on mangroves uh, mitigated tsunami, or Professor Das's work on Odisha cyclone and the role of mangroves, uh, I think they were well ahead of time and set the tune for uh, some of the research topic that we are uh, taking today. So as uh, Dr. Rupesh already mentioned that as a policy researchers, uh, on, on broadly working on natural resource conservation. I'd like to say that uh, mangrove, uh, the new opportunities and challenges in mangrove research, particularly uh, from a policy planner's perspective and what kind of methods or what kind of scientific tools we can use uh, to bridge those gaps. So first, uh, let me take you uh, to three of three global uh, sustainability agendas. Uh, for example, since 2015, we are we have seen the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. Uh, then we have seen the sustainable development goals, and we are expected to see the uh, the new IG targets, the CBD targets in 2022. So, if we look closely, uh, conservation and regeneration of mangroves uh, cuts across all these three three major uh, global agenda. For example, uh, it is now established uh, that mangroves. Uh, I think it's more than established that mangroves reduce coastal flood risks, uh, it, it reduces the intensity of storm surges of flooding and provides strong protection uh, during coast, coastal hazards. Uh, and of course, it has a direct uh, coincidence as Professor Kathirasen has found and numerous research across the world uh, found that it has direct correlation uh, in reducing loss of life and damage. Uh, and moreover, the, these are extremely efficient as well as cost effective, particularly when we see from a uh, developing or least developed countries perspective. So now if we take the Sendai framework for disaster itself for say, so it strongly advocates for fostering uh, ecosystem-based strategies uh, for as a disaster reduction measure. And of course, mangroves undoubtedly tops the list, uh, particularly in Asia, which is the, the largest uh, coastline. Uh, recently, we uh, did a uh, review for mangrove ecosystem services and how uh, so it contributes to other like sustainable development uh, goals. And we have uh, classified more than 200 papers uh, to understand how uh, the mangrove ecosystem services particularly contribute to uh, localization of uh, uh, sustainable development goals. And we found a, a broad range of uh, uh, SDGs, uh, in particular three SDGs, like SDGs 12, uh, the responsible consumption and production, uh, SDG 3, a very important uh, climate action, and SDG 15, uh, which showed very strong correlation with the performance of mangrove ecosystem services. So again, I'm saying this because uh, we have this global sustainability agenda at one hand, and mangrove conservation on the other hand, but there is a very strong overlap. And if I say the, uh, the IG conservation targets, which is again, very important biodiversity targets, which will be taken in 2022, at least four targets, for example, target six, uh, which is uh, on sustainable fisheries, uh, target 11 on protection measures, ecological, uh, target 15, which is on ecosystem restoration and resilience, and target 19, which is knowledge on science and technology. So all these uh, four uh, uh, kind of IG conservation targets are related to mangroves. And there are some recent papers which talks about that despite a very good progress being made over this uh, four component, but there are the, these targets are still unmade. So again, uh, it does re doesn't require to discuss how important mangroves are from the climate mitigation perspective. We all know that, uh, that carbon sequest, for example, the carbon uh, sequestration potential for mangrove is five times larger than any other tropical uh, forest. And rightfully, uh, the mangrove occupies the central agenda for forest-based mitigation. But given that uh, we are very concerned with climate mitigation, but at the same time, 
Uh, it is also important to account and mainstream the, for the role of mangrove ecosystem service and their contribution in ecosystem-based adaptation measures, uh, which is really, really important. And for fostering the ecosystem-based adaptation measures, uh, it is also important to know how uh, the future delivery of uh, mangrove ecosystem will be. Uh, for example, uh, I think you might recall a paper from uh, Professor Dukes uh, who mentioned like, uh, I think it is in 2007, he mentioned that maybe uh, the mangrove ecosystem service will completely annihilate in, uh, then by the next century. So although these projections may be a bit uh, arbitrary, but it is important to locally assess the future state of mangrove ecosystem services to foster any, any sort of adaptation strategy in coastal areas. So in this regard, I'd like to bring a little bit of the context of IPBS, which is where I work uh, as a, one of the lead author. So the IPBS or Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity Ecosystem Services actually called for using uh, the scenarios and models to better understand the plausibility of future delivery of ecosystem services. Uh, so we, as uh, like a policy researchers, we have uh, actually done some uh, research on this in this line. So we have recently concluded an important multi-culty project where WII is one of our partner to monitor the future uh, availability of mangrove ecosystem services using state of, of uh, state of the art simulation techniques. Uh, we have collaborated with uh, many other research institute, uh, particularly from Asia and Pacific, uh, in Fiji, Taiwan, uh, Philippines, and of course from India. So we have worked very closely with WII in the Andaman Islands and Peter Kanika uh, under and, and tried to understand how the diverse uh, developmental possibility uh brings down or engage the mangrove uh, like in, increase the man mangrove ecosystem services and we have used uh spatially expertise scenarios so that the local policy planners can read those maps and uh, use it for their policy planning purpose so as a uh, as a policy planner as well as as a special scientist i'm really excited uh, and i am sure that you might, might share the same kind of excitement uh, to see the recent advancement in technical tools and data uh, which is, I'm sure, going to revolutionize the, man revo revolutionize the mangrove research. Uh, for example, we have much better remote sensing data and models uh, today. In fact, the drones has played a very important part of uh, mangrove monitoring uh, methodology. I'm sure you'll be discussing all this uh, in today's uh, session. Uh, so despite this, uh, I'd like to uh, conclude with uh, one important thing. And I think for the last two days, uh, different researchers and professors have talked on this. Uh, so what very important is uh, to manage the man in the mangroves. Uh, so despite uh, all of our good research and we have published thoroughly on mangrove uh, ecosystem services, uh, we have to consider uh, the, how to manage the mangroves with involving the local communities. And that is what I think Professor Kathirasan also mentioned and many other researchers have mentioned. Uh, and also I have, uh, I have also feel, I have a strong feeling that we have so far been a little bit biased towards mangrove regulating services, uh, not really considered uh, the other services like provisioning uh, and supporting services and particularly cultural services into that, the planning context or uh, policy planning context. So I was really, really very happy to see some of uh, our researchers presented yesterday was talking about socio-cultural values of mangroves. So it was really, really very good. So I, I really feel like in future, uh, people will more work on, uh, on this kind of uh, cultural ecosystem services. Uh, uh, last but not the least, uh, the future of mangroves uh, will depend how we involve the local communities over it. And um, of course, the national level policy, whatever we say, that will help. Uh, however, the, everything boils down to the sustainable uh, coexistence between people and mangrove. Uh, so you know that many uh, cases in Asia, uh, the conservation efforts uh, failed because uh, the lack of uh, community participation, despite of good policies. So therefore, uh, I think it is more important for us and people like uh, who are engaged into mangrove research uh, to direct research in more meaningful engagement of communities in uh, mangrove uh, conservation. Uh, lastly, uh, I think one of the major important aspect to foster uh, mangrove research is a global partnership. Uh, as you know that many of the mangrove ecosystem services are transboundary in nature, be it in Sundarbans or in Africa, these systems, while uh, being ecologically connected, but remains fragmented under different management regime. Therefore, it is really important to foster the transboundary partnership. So these are some of the points I thought are uh, very important for future research, but I'm looking really looking forward to the engaging discussions today. So with, with this, uh, let me welcome you once again uh, on the day three, the final day of this conference. 
and I look forward to your participation and very engaging discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Dasgupta. This was a very succinct but very comprehensive introduction of the topic. It summarizes all of uh, uh, sort of where we are in terms of mangrove knowledge, mangrove research, mangrove sciences, and where we are, we have to go, where we are intending to go. One thing that really resonated to me is what you said that we have to manage the man in the mangrove. And just to be gender neutral, I think we have to manage the human in the mangrove to make sure uh, absolutely, every, absolutely. Ev everyone is covered. But, yeah. uh, but that, that's where actually uh, the, all the practical and um, uh, challenges and opportunities lies uh, because these are intertwined, the issues that you raised about transboundary, uh, flow of ecosystem services, the policies, the regulations. Uh, and that's why it, it becomes even more important that we have these kinds of discussions where these points are raised and we try to make our, uh, our path uh, in a direct, uh, to, to make our progress in the direction where we will find some pathways towards a better sustainable, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, life for, for, for all communities everywhere. So with that, I think uh, this is a very good beginning uh, for our uh, next uh, uh, presentation, which is our keynote address. And we are very uh, privileged to have uh, Professor Daniel Mordiaso from C40 Craft to have with us, who will be actually discussing about how mangrove science can inform and influence policy. But before I provide Professor uh, Mardiaso's introduction, which I believe a lot of you already know, it doesn't require much of introduction, but I just want to make one a quick announcement, a housekeeping announcement that skipped me. If you have any questions, all, it's all for all participants, audience members, if they have any questions uh, for the presentation or anything our speakers, CISO's people are saying, then kindly type that in Q&A box. For any general comment, any observation, any other message, anything else that you want to convey, please use the chat box. Uh, we will be looking at Q&A answer to respond, but uh, the, your comments will be well preserved and uh, recorded in the chat box. So with that, I move to, uh, uh, to Professor Daniel Mordiaso, who is a principal scientist at C4ECraft and also a professor at Department of Geophysics and Metrology at IPB University, Bogor, Indonesia. His research is related to land use change and biogeochemical cycles and climate change mitigation and adaptation. He has published extensively uh, several peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and one of the, the papers about mangrove science, uh, about uh, mangroves being uh, repositories of carbon, uh, has almost cited more than, I, I believe, 10,000 times now. Uh, Professor Murdiasaro has been involved in several IPCC assessment report, including the IPCC special report on land use, land, land use change and forestry. And in, 20, uh, in 2000, he served the government of Indonesia as deputy minister of environment for two years. Uh, during that, he was a national focal point of UNFCC and CBD. He is also a member of many national and international committees, including Indonesian Academy of Sciences. So we are very honored and privileged to have you here, Professor Mardiaso. Uh, we look forward to hear, uh, uh, hear you speak about how mangrove science can inform and influence policy. Over to you. Thank you, Rupesh, for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and your slides are also clear. Great, thank you. So as Rupesh uh, described my life, <laughs> uh, I've been in two kind of world trying to mingle between science and policies. And um, that's what I'm going to share with you, how we, we did it for mangrove in the past, well, 10 years or so, um, trying to um, influence the decision-making processes and how can mangrove or blue carbon science can be part of that. So let, let me begin by describing what I'm, I'm going to uh, say in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, so delivering science is, is is something, but uh, more importantly is how can we uh, walk over that uh, through various processes, uh, beginning from you know, the science itself, uh, how can we deliver uh, credible science and find evidence 
And then at the same time, we also very um, privileged to have the opportunity to build the capacity of young people, uh, students, and, and also a policy community uh, <clears throat> regarding the, the knowledge and information, even new information about mangrove. So we, we have to you know, plan ahead um, intentionally how to uh, make that kind of platform possible by having dialogue between science and policy. So that's, that's very crucial. And even if we are in a position of being passive, a communicating, communicating science is, is very key, how we do that in, in this kind of world with uh, uh, virtual platform and things like that is very important. So it's not just doing science itself, but how to communicate and interact with them directly. That's, that's what I am going to describe this morning and uh, beginning by um, showing how and where we have been working. It's, I think it's more than 20 uh, countries uh, now under the, the SWARM program that we have uh, that stands for Sustainable Wetland Adaptation and Mitigation Program covering across the tropics, uh, working on wetland, mainly peatland and mangrove. So that's, that's how, uh, and where we work so far and trying to gather those information I described earlier. So um, let me just give you a, some example where we work in Africa. This is in Mozambique, trying to use uh, remote sensing, high resolution uh, imagery to look at not only uh, the carbon, but also the height of the trees. Uh, colleagues from the US Forest Service and, and C4, um, US Forest Service is our partner working in, in Mozambique again. Uh, at the same time, we build the capacity of local uh, university, local government, etc. And um, this is the work in, in uh, Gazi Bay in Kenya. It's mainly dealing or connecting uh, mangrove science with policy at the local level. And in, in uh, Vietnam, we work in a very extensive restoration area in the Mekong uh, Delta and, and also the uh, post-war um, degraded mangrove <clears throat> in, in Vietnam. So all these things have been published and we, we managed to organize special issues in uh, conferences and, and that's the way we channel the information through uh, the scientific community. And of course, in India, um, uh, led by Rupesh, even before he joined C4 formally, we already started back in 2015. Oh my God, it's a long time ago. And uh, uh, here is the collection of things that we do across uh, the globe. Uh, and also in, <clears throat> sorry, the Western part of Africa and Latin America. And today I want to share more, um, intensively about our work in, in Indonesia, which um, mainly cover issues, not only uh, carbon, but also the sedimentation processes as we are working in degraded mangrove and as well as in, in conserve or protected mangrove. So we've been gathering so much information in these areas with different setting of mangrove across the archipelago. So the way we, we present the result is something like this, um, showing the carbon stock when it is um, uh, degraded and how it will prevail in terms of uh, recovery. And um, you can see here, um, and this is the main message we try to convey that even if you uh, degrade the above ground biomass, the, the mangrove itself, uh, temporarily, you still have a great deal of carbon in the soil. So um, protecting that site or location or uh, uh, entities is very crucial to put the vegetation back so that you have this source of carbon. And also legalizing the, the sites for protection or man proper management of it. So we, we convey this, this message in a very recent um, publication. In addition to that, we also try to look at the other aspect of restoration or rehabilitation is the, the way mangrove help 
and facilitate the process of sedimentation, trapping the sediment, and at the same time, also a certain amount of carbon in it. So uh, we cover both uh, carbon and sediment, and this is very important information when we are talking about restoration program, restoration activities and project and things like that. So we, in the past, been uh, collecting all this information, put it in a publication, a formal journal, etc. And I, I have just been informed by Kania, who is in the room, that we have more than 150 uh, peer review publication in a journal and uh, dozens of uh, uh, working paper and, and uh, short uh, communication uh, for different kind of communities. So it's, it's quite um, uh, prolific in the past 10 years, so 150 more or less. So that's that's about 15 publications a year. That's, that's quite uh, promising in terms of informing uh, the policy community. So um, we also try very uh, hard and, and intensively to translate that kind of information into more digestible information in a kind of uh, infographic like this. And we found it's very powerful to inform you know, people in the street and uh, lay people about how important it is to protect and, and restore uh, mangrove as a carbon kind of reservoir in that kind of situation. So we, we do a lot of this kind of uh, communication in terms of uh, informing uh, society at large about very difficult and uh, rarely uh, talk about this uh, ecosystem, which is tend to be marginalized. So when, when I was at school, um, Mangalore was hated so much because there are so many uh, mosquito and the muddy, smelly, etc. So it's uh, time now to turn the tide and informing that this is not the way we should think about mangrove. This is something that is very precious for generation to come, for feeding the community, for protecting the planet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So doing this kind of information, public uh, relationship. Uh, is, is very crucial if we are uh, talking about mangrove, very difficult topic and new in many communities. And suddenly we uh, maintain our website very regularly. Even this event is already there. You can see in our website, um, um, swarm slash, uh, sorry, C4 slash uh, swarm. You can see a very up to date kind of information in all aspects, including publication and, and activities and toolbox, etc. So please visit the, the website if you want to know more about SWOM in particular and our work in, in Mangrove. And sounds like a commercial. <laughs> we, we try also to work in the global community. Um, uh, we, we were invited by the UNFCCC to form a workshop. And this is very crucial uh, in that time because um, high carbon reservoir was not covered in any agenda of the UNFCCC in the convention. So the, the, the title of that workshop is intentionally made that clear that this issue is not covered. So from that time on, it is covered, it is uh, getting, uh, you know, uh, known better and better. So that's also the time when we influence the process of developing the uh, supplement of the IPCC guideline for wetland, where mangrove is in chapter four, very prominently appear there. And it is now being uh, considered and adopted and used for many countries, including uh, Indonesia, where I've been working a lot in the NDC and the uh, development of uh, forest reference emission level, FREL. And um, in the past, uh, the IPCC guideline 2006 uh, was used, uh, but now um, one can use uh, the follow um, or a follow aspect, uh, especially uh, uh, by adopting the wetland uh, chapter of, of this uh, document. So that's what happened in Indonesia. So NDC and FRL 
for red plus uh, activities uh, adopting this uh, guideline so that it is separate out from the AFUL um, guideline. We also work with uh, policy community in, in uh, propagating the news about the importance of blue carbon, uh, coastal blue carbon, especially mangrove, um, in event like this um, very high uh, platform to inform the public policy uh, making processes. And uh, we end up with producing this uh, kind of document so that blue carbon is now mainstream in Indonesian policies, uh, including the um, long-term plan to adopt uh, blue carbon science or uh, NDC, et cetera. And um, last but not least, it's also important to inform the local community, local government to uh, use how the um, <clears throat> blue carbon can be part of, of that um, project and activities when we are working with uh, people in the context of uh, climate change uh, uh, mitigation, uh, maintaining the carbon stock, improving uh, the degraded uh, mangrove, etc. So that um, at the same time, we also promote the adaptation aspect of mangrove by uh, showing how important it is to have it. Uh, when we related that to the local livelihood, the fish cats, etc. And more importantly, it's even down to earth, uh, making uh, many of issues with human face when we are talking about health and nutrition of the local community. So we, we try to capture all this information while uh, informing uh, uh, the local government and local community um, and, and, and the society at large. So to conclude, um, it is important that uh, wetland science, including mangrove, uh, has to be promoted um, tirelessly uh, because it is least known compared with other issues like terrestrial forests. Uh, but it is uh, very, very strategic to, to know about this uh, ecosystem uh, better in, in the near future. Um, it is also encouraging that, uh, as far as we know, in Indonesia, the, the effort has been uh, reaping now the uh, uh, fruits um, and has come to fruition when you see things are adopted for policy making uh, processes. So uh, communication is not always with uh, scientific community. It's, uh, we, we have to be able to translate uh, the knowledge that we uh, gain from this scientific um, method into the uh, policy and community at large. So be simple and informative about it. Uh, if you expect the information is going to be absorbed, adopted and, and used in the public policy making processes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pajanil. Thank you for uh, uh, sharing your wide breadth of uh, you know, experience, knowledge, your involvement in, in various forums, national, international, and at local levels, and how this sort of you know, tapestry of, uh, uh, of uh, advancement in mangrove science involve all these uh, interventions at all these levels. Uh, I think one of the, the key messages that uh, you highlighted is the role of uh, science to generate, uh, uh, you know, evidence, the data based on certain methods uh, with the ro robust practices. And then that's, that's just the first step. It doesn't stop there. We need to translate that information, that knowledge to the people who can most benefit uh, in order to to manage these ecosystem in a better way. So whether it has to be in terms of uh, improving and changes in policy, or also how to make uh, communities who who are living in these areas, uh, you know, uh, get benefit with that. So um, these connections, these linkages are very important, and we take that uh, message uh, loud and clear. 
that as scientists, our work doesn't stop by just publishing a paper. We need to make sure that that information goes to the people who are who can then make decisions and then a real change can happen on the ground, uh, both for the ecosystem, but also for the people who are, I would say, best positioned to, to conserve these areas for posterity. So um, we, since you finished well in time, uh, I must thank you that uh, you are setting a very good precedence for today's program. And I think all other speakers and resource people will, will uh, keep that in mind and will stay in time and have a little more time for discussions, something which we didn't have uh, last two days. And today's session is basically the, 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 the message, the essence will come out from all these discussions. So this is a very good beginning. I'm very pleased with that. Um, there are a few questions if you do not uh, mind answering them. So I'm just filtering them and uh, I'll, I'll pose one or a couple to you, uh, which uh, seems straightforward. One is uh, from Ajit Kumar Singh, and he is interested in knowing how carbon estimation is made in the roots. Uh, you would like to respond, Daniel? Yes, yes, I saw the q and A. If if I don't have time in the slot uh, that you've made, uh, I will type them up uh, later. But uh, yes, the first question is very very crucial <clears throat> because uh, oftentimes we we neglect this in our report um, and see in mangrove as vegetation, very charismatic one. Um, but it is very important that this uh, ecosystem has a very high uh, net primary production, even if it is small, you know, the turnover in terms of uh, leaves, litter, and also dead fine root is very high. So this is the most productive ecosystem and all of them are um, deposited in the soil and decomposed there. So we can track down to, you know, very simple um, and relatively uh, cheap method using the lab to then to trace back how all this carbon are or sediment are uh, back to 100, uh, 200 years back. And we can um, not only date that, but also estimate uh, <clears throat> the biomass, the root biomass uh, and decay and how they contribute to the soil organic carbon by um, putting all this uh, well, artificial, not artificial root, but artificial uh, bag to collect all the root uh, and then submerge it in the soil so that you can you can uh, estimate the decomposition rate by weighing and looking at the uh, um, decomposition processes. Uh, unlike in the peatland uh, situation where it is continuously submerged, in the coastal zone, you have tidal rains. So sometimes they are submerged, sometimes they are not. So this will give the opportunity for the microbes and, and also the uh, macro bentos, macro fauna to, to digest this uh, biomass. So you can see how fast it is compared with the uh, permanently submerged environment like inland peatland. So yes, you, you can measure it directly. Um, but in the long term, um, measuring soil carbon that I cannot describe this uh, today for you, but you can you can visit uh, our website and see the protocol how to measure and how to sample and measure this thing. That's I would recommend you to to visit that. Thank you, Rubash. Yeah, thank you, Padania. Yes, indeed, this was a question that came up yesterday. Also, uh, there is a lot of interest in, in standardizing the methods and what methods can be used for total ecosystem carbon stocks, and in that, uh, all the above ground, below ground uh, uh, compartments of carbon can be assessed. So, as Padania mentioned, uh, please visit the website uh, because it is not just for this protocol, but there are other information, other papers, other publications there, which might be of interest and use. So uh, with that, I will move to our uh, next uh, speaker. Um, uh, but I encourage again participants to type their question in Q&A and, a, and uh, our panel members and speakers will respond to them either by typing or answering them live. Um, so uh, after our keynote address, uh, we move to our first speaker uh, of uh, day three, 
who is uh, Dr. Nehru Prabhakaran. Uh, Dr. Nehru Prabhakaran is uh, also um, co, as I use the term, co conspirator in organizing this uh, this conference and, and bringing all of us together. So he, he, he does uh, uh, need that mention here. He's also generously uh, agreed to share some of the recent trends in mangrove research within Southeast Asia. That, that's what he will be covering. He is a DST-inspired faculty at Wildlife Institute of India, um, based in Dehradun. He is an ecologist focusing on vegetation recovery following natural and anthropogenic disturbances. That's his area of work. He holds a PhD in botany from Bhartiyar University, and he is a recipient of Lebanese Dad postdoctoral fellowship in 2014, uh, where he uh, conducted research in Germany, and also DST Inspire Faculty Award in India in 2018. His research largely focuses on mangrove community responses to the sea level change associated with tectonic subsidence and uplift in Andaman and Nicobar Island. And I had the distinct pleasure of uh, being with him in the field. So I <clears throat> benefited from his extensive knowledge of Andaman and Nicobar. And uh, uh, so I would also like to thank him for, for lending that. With that, Dr. Nehru, floor, floor is uh, yours. Uh, thank you, Rupesh, for a generous introduction. And uh, Wanakkam, good morning for all the people uh, attending this webinar from uh, across different uh, states and different countries. And so let me share my screen. Looks good, Nehru. Can you, yes. can you make it full screen, please? Yes, yes. Good to Is go. Full screen, yeah. So, uh, yes. So last uh, two days, we had a wonderful session. And often, uh, uh, some of the keynote speakers or some of the speakers have highlighted the uh, knowledge gaps. And uh, what I'm going to do in the next uh, 15 minutes or so is uh, not only just highlighting some of the knowledge gaps, but also having a chance to you know look at the trends in how mangrove publications have evolved over the time. Just to note, a uh, number of publications uh, in uh, under different thematic areas or uh, at different time periods. How this, you know, number of pu scientific publications in terms of mangrove ecosystems have progressed in the last uh, five decades. And uh, it is uh, no rocket science that looking at the past provides uh, great insights to go forward in the future. And uh, time and again, it's been proven in many scientific fields and mangrove is no exemption. Uh, many uh, reviews, uh, review works have in fact contributed a lot to the uh, lot to taking mangrove science forward. For example, there are studies that are uh, very specific to uh, countries or uh, global level studies, uh, studies of various kinds, uh, looking at land use land cover patterns across the globe or sea level rise, uh, how it impacts global mangroves, or uh, the n number of such studies uh, at, at regional as well as global scales. And not only these studies help us to uh, understand how things have progressed in the past, but also these kind of uh, review of extensive literature can also help us make a frameworks or a synthesis of ideas and this framework in, in, in fact can provide a greater insight to go forward in the uh, future. For example, the reason uh, one that uh, uh, along with uh, Dr. Farid, uh, we also worked is uh, putting mango socio-ecological systems, fitting them into the uh, adaptive cycle framework. This was one of the first uh, such attempts of you know, ma making mango socio-ecological systems into a, a well-known concepts like adaptive cycle. Such kind of attempts can have a often larger reach than just you know mangrove researchers in uh, around the world, and also uh, another uh, regional study uh, specifically focused to uh, Singapore, where uh, Fraser et al. Uh, in 2020 attempted to you know put uh, scientific value to the uh, to the different indicators and how this you know uh, and they provided a qualitative framework for scientific value of different indicator within man within coastal ecosystem different subject areas of uh, 
related to uh, marine and coastal ecosystem and mangrove is one among them and uh, however in india if you look at though there are so many uh, review studies been done um so we we came to know around 42 review studies on mangroves are available in uh, available for indian mangroves but uh, if you dig deeper into details these studies are either uh, local specific like uh, the uh, welcome address speaker rajeshri has mentioned their recent paper on uh, bitter kanika was though it is covering a, a extensive volume of uh, information it is a very regional specific and uh, like uh, Professor Kadirisen's work in uh, Pichavaram, this is like, though they provide a very good scientific information, very good basis to take research forward, they are very uh, you know, uh, specific to a region. And uh, in otherwise, even if you have an India specific research, they are quite uh, subject specific. For example, the first day speaker Raghavan's, his paper is mostly uh, looking at mangrove floristics in India. And likewise, there are uh, and how anthropogenic pollution can affect mangrove biodiversity in India. There are review papers. Likewise, there are a number of uh, other uh, review papers looking at uh, different aspects. So either these review papers are region specific or subject specific. Therefore, uh, there is no, uh, there is not much of attempt has been made to understand how uh, in, a, in different thematic areas how. Uh, what are the uh, available uh, uh, literature in, in terms of Indian mangroves? And um, so keeping that in mind, uh, so this particular uh, work, it, it's very recently we, we, we done actually, it's, it's still an ongoing work. And uh, these, uh, we take inspiration from these two, par two particular studies and we try to uh, uh, replicate more or less similar aspects of uh, mentioned in these two studies. Uh, one is uh, from Colombia. But they looked at the temporal trends, geographical coverage, and research gaps over the you know complete uh, uh, over the century in uh, Colombia. So likewise, uh, like I mentioned in the previous, uh, Daniel Frey and his team had worked in uh, Singapore, and what they did, they did a similar attempt, but then they went a step forward to provide a quantitative framework for scientific value for different uh, key ecosystems. Uh, related to marine and uh, but for this particular talk i will only restrict to uh, temporal trends and geographical coverage and research gaps but our uh, overall goal is to uh, take this research forward and make a framework uh, exclusive for mango and under different thematic areas and uh, so the major objectives for this particular study is to understand the trends in mango research during the past five decades it's a past five decades is just a random choice. Uh, we, we expect that uh, looking at last five decades itself can provide a lot of information about how these trends have evolved over time. And also our another objective is to look at key areas of key, key areas of research focus in the past and recent trends in collaboration efforts and also uh, identifying major knowledge gaps and important research areas for future research. I will mostly talking about the first three objectives and touch upon the last objective, which is kind of over the last two year, two days also we've been hearing a lot about this. And uh, we we use the uh, Prisma protocol, which is a preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta analysis. And uh, we used uh, uh, mangrove specific keywords, number of mangrove specific keywords ranging from mangrove India or mangrove different states that has uh, mangrove cover in India or different subjects like mangrove phytoplankton, ma mangrove vegetation ecology. So we use number of keywords to search for uh, documents and we kept the time frame of 1971 to 20, 2021. And uh, lastly, we use uh, Google Scholar search engine for this uh, particular work. And uh, if you look at uh, the advantage of using Google Scholar in, in such kind of a review work, it has proven that I mean, it, it has, uh, Google Scholar has a higher capacity to uh, retrieve uh, information that are very uh, local specific or information that are uh, actually a gray literature that does not you know, have a public published in a, a journal or something. So uh, these two particular research, uh, one by Fraze and uh, 
uh, Gustavo had established that around tenfold uh, higher capacity of uh, Google Scholar to retrieve uh, scientific data, scientific literature compared to uh, uh, compared to other search engines like uh, Scopus and Web of Science. So keeping in that uh, mind, and in Indian con uh, context, there may be a lot of uh, literature that could be uh, still uh, uh, lying as a gray literature. So in that case, we use Google Scholar for this work. And uh, we have also looked at Swat Ganga, that's a reservoir of Indian uh, PhD thesis. Uh, it's a database where you can get to know about all the PhD theses uh, in the Indian universities. So we also use this search engines to get more information. Also be screened through the bibliography section of most of the downloaded articles, downloaded literatures to uh, gather more information. And uh, we have screened almost more than 2000 uh, literatures uh, for their eligibility to be considered in this work. And um, we screen through the abstract to understand whether, to understand its relevance to the mangrove research. Uh, so uh, at the end, we, we narrow down to around 1,165 articles or, or publications related to Indian mangroves. And uh, if you look at the cumulative uh, number of publication over the years, there's a striking increase in the recent decades. In the last two decades, there was a, a great number of uh, publications being uh, uh, published in, uh, especially in uh, international publications. But uh, uh, if you look at the categories of publication, research articles are dominated and uh, there are eight different categories of articles, book chapters, conference and international uh, proceedings and uh, national conferences, or PhD thesis, the technical uh, reports. So there are some eight, uh, the entire uh, 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 literature has been uh, categorized as nine different categories. And uh, if you look at the geographical uh, coverage of these studies, uh, most uh, Sundarbans had the highest number of publications, uh, followed by uh, Odisha, which had Mahanadi Delta as well as uh, uh, Bitar Kanika and uh, Tamil Nadu, another uh, one of the uh, uh, key player to the mangrove literature, uh, especially uh, Pichavaram had the highest number of mangrove publications, uh, followed by other places, uh, Andaman Nicobar Islands and uh, Gulf of Kutch in Gujarat. And if you look at the average number of publication per year, how it has grown uh, for each of the decades, uh, until uh, 2020, there was a modest increase. But if you see afterwards, from 2001 to 2010, if you look closer, until 2001 to 2004, there was not much of an increase. But just after 2005, there is a sudden increase in number of publications. And afterwards, it, the, the trend has continued. And uh, if you uh, look at the mangrove publication at, uh, uh, at East Coast, West Coast, as well as uh, islands, uh, concern. East Coast had always had a highest number of publications and uh, West, followed by West Coast as, and then Andaman Nicobar Islands. Though Andaman Nicobar Islands has a high, you know, one among the uh, richest uh, mangrove biodiversity area in, in the country, still it, it in terms of scientific publication it is still quite lagging behind. Uh, so uh, this trend, if you look at the trend, again, uh, like you see in the previous slide, uh, after 2000, there is a stark increase, right? And uh, this, uh, the number of publications in uh, East Coast, West Coast and uh, islands are also very comparable to the mangrove area these uh, uh, regions has. And if you look closer, the spike, so this is also like after 2004, you have a greater spike in number of publications. And we suspect that the after tsunami and number of cyclones in this particular uh, time period had provided more awareness about the importance of mangrove that had led to a sudden increase in number of publications in mangrove. For example, if you, uh, for example, when we compared the, uh, these two keywords within the titles of the publications that we come across, until 2004, hardly one publication had this 
with cyclone in the title whereas after 2005 to 2021 there were 27 publications which had these two uh, one of these two keywords in their titles and uh, uh, thematic area wise vegetation ecology had the most number of publications this particular thematic area only concerned to this uh, 70 odd mangrove species and in india it's only around 45 mangrove species and your sperms uh, it, it's almost like one third of all the publications are concerning to the vegetation ecology aspect while fauna though it has a wide variety of uh, it includes wide variety of organisms ranging from single cell organism to uh, mammals uh, it has though it has a highest uh, second highest number of publication but comparatively with the given the diversity of groups involved in it it may be much much lesser and uh, other uh, uh, groups like bacteria fungi planktons uh, diatoms so all these put together they had a much lesser representation as well uh, and uh, though india has a number of uh, uh, restoration projects across india there are uh, very few literature that talks about these restoration aspects uh, though uh, the recent times there was some evolution i mean uh, qualitative evaluation of these restoration projects uh, attempted in uh, gulf of kutch but such attempts are uh, not being carried out in many other parts in the country and uh, carbon estimation carbon stalkers also very recently we had a good number of publication coming up on carbon stock estimation within india and uh, mostly from the east coast whereas in the west coast uh, such uh, attempts are still need to step up and uh, we we took uh, citations as an indicator of uh, how much these uh, publications are recognized around uh, 50 percentage of the publications had less than one or less than 10 citations and only hardly 12 percentage of the uh, publications had more than uh, 100 citations and uh, if, how often do we collaborate that's again a one, one thing we we have to look at and uh, uh, almost more than uh, almost 60 percentage of the publications were single institutional publications where uh, not much of there is no collaboration between the institutions happen and uh, around 40 percentage of the publications have uh, collaborate collaborations more than one in two institutions coming together and uh, again we see a spike in number of collaborative publication uh, after 2010 <coughs> excuse and uh, if you dig deeper into detail, uh, number of foreign collaborations in the publications, it's, uh, we don't have much. In fact, around 14% of these publications have uh, foreign collaborating authors. And uh, the last decades, more or less, the, the, it, it had remained same in the last decade. So there, there's not much of an increase. While uh, institution within India collaborating to bring up publications have though increased uh, in, uh, just before the last decade, but in the in the last five six years it's more or less remained you know relatively lesser than the you know previous five years. And the major players in terms of collaborative research with Indian organization is uh, USA more than uh, around fifty publications from uh, US. And uh, other developing uh, developed nations from the Western countries like uh, Germany, France, and uh, Belgium, UK, they had also played a major role in this collaborative research. And within Asia, uh, we have some publications from Japan, uh, some major publications from Japan. And uh, if you look at the area of mangroves for each of the states within India, uh, though it, it may not indicate that the bigger the area, the larger the number of publications, but also some of the uh, states, though it had relatively less uh, mangrove cover, for example, uh, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, they, they have more number of publications compared to uh, the, the mangrove area. So it, it mostly it indicates that the local specific institutions are the key players in taking mangrove research forward. and many of this I mean, uh, as far as tamil nadu is concerned it is anamala university which had most number of publications on mangroves 
and likewise in uh, kerala uh, cochin university with its uh, marine uh, department had more number of contribution to mangrove literature so this local specific institutions have contributed more to the mangrove research and uh, in terms of major research gap like i uh, like i highlighted in the uh, slide uh, faunal groups are either, uh, least uh, studied like it, it has been uh, emphasized over last two days as well um, we had very less number of studies in terms of faunal groups and uh, despite number of uh, great volume of uh, vegetation ecology related studies there is no uh, meta analysis studies as so far attempted to understand you know the either the east coast specific study or a west coast so there is no study so far attempted to understand a larger perspective and uh, also uh, though recent times uh, some focus is given for long term monitoring studies still as far as mangrove research is concerned uh, it, it is still way behind terrestrial ecosystems there even in the recent time there is a push for long term ecological research, monitoring research in the country and most of these are concerned to the terrestrial ecosystems whereas mangroves are still in terms in these terms are uh, slightly neglected so i and i acknowledge my uh, uh, collaborators uh, student collaborators anup raj singh and uh, pramada sharan for uh, for their contribution to this uh, study this this is ongoing study and i also acknowledge the funding agencies uh, dsc inspire program uh, as well as rufford small grant program for uh, funding our uh, group thank you thank you dr mehru <coughs> for providing uh, the detailed analysis of uh, publications coming out from uh, on indian mangroves um this is actually very insightful because it tells that the the, the good news is that the publications uh, number is increasing and been uh, increasing fast in recent times uh, just goes to show that people researchers are, are uh, more inclined to study these areas there is more funding available there are more uh, institutional support available but at the same time i think your presentation showed that uh, a large uh, a large gap still exists in terms of collaborations in terms of partnerships and uh, a meaningful advancement of science uh, as far as i i believe can come when a great minds can come together a lot of people can collaborate a lot of institutions come can come together and uh, this this actually goes to show how countries where no mangroves exist as you highlighted in germany france uh, they have been collaborating and and part of uh, publications so that goes it's only possible with with the collaboration so looking uh, you know focusing even just uh, on one country in india i think this this highlights the need that researchers across india and we have many uh, as this conference shows as the the discussion we have had in last three days shows have a good amount of researchers focusing uh, a lot of their um, scientific inquiry in these ecosystems and they can come together to have a little more holistic uh, understanding of the sea seascape a uh, lot more understanding of the continuity of these coastal ecosystems uh, and, and more precisely so because uh, the challenge in front of us is immense climate change uh, is important mangroves provide a great nature based solutions and very important not just for mitigation but for adaptation for the sustainable livelihoods of the communities living there so uh, i i think th this uh, provides a snapshot or, or it gives us a, a lens to look through where our energy should be spent so thank you so much for sharing that i believe there will be a lot more questions uh, and people might reach out to you in terms of uh, uh, more informations uh, on the publications that you have found and uh, used in your presentation um i think we are uh, right on time and in in terms of question and a box uh, i do not see uh, any specific question related to your presentation nehru these are general question about different topics which we will pick up in, in our larger panel discussion in the second half uh and i i encourage other panel members if there are shorter questions which can be responded by typing so please go ahead and do that um 
So moving to our uh, next part, which is uh, uh, coming up on a break. Uh, but before the break, I have two things. One is a, a group photo. Uh, this is our third um, day with a, a different set of speakers and resource people. So we will uh, break for a, a photo. Be uh, before the break, we'll take a group photo. Uh, but before taking group photo, I would like to uh, also make a small announcement about a post-workshop survey, evaluation survey. And this is uh, very important for us to gauge how successful uh, this workshop has been, how informative this workshop has been, and how well we covered the topics that, that are important and interesting. So there will be a link for a workshop uh, survey, which will be posted after the panel discussion in the chat box visible to all participants, kindly click on that link and complete this online survey. It shouldn't take more than 10 minutes and is, it provides a value, very valuable and important information for, to us. Uh, what we did good, uh, where there uh, is still some room for improvement and if we plan for such event in future, what best uh, we should uh, try to capture. So that will be very important. Um, now I'll request Vito to take over from me and uh, do your magic, uh, bringing all of us in one panel. Um, I'll request all of our resource members and, and speakers to turn on their video briefly so Vito can take the picture. And after the picture, we will take a short break. Yes, thank you, Dr. Rupres. Please turn on your camera. Okay, for those who already attend this from the first day, you know the drill, right? So, okay, we have, okay, more camera to come. Professor Siva Kumar, if you please uh, turn on your camera so we can uh, gather everybody in the same frame. Taking a good picture and have your widest smile in three one two three one more time okay one more time okay smile again one two three all right thank you that's all back to your best thank you vito thank you all so this is about 10 40 um uh, and uh, our, our talk the next talk will will start very shortly but i'll i'll, I'll take uh, maybe five minutes break so people can have a cup of coffee or a, or a drink and we'll resume in 10 45 india time so in five minutes thank you see you soon okay so we are back after our short break um i thank you again everyone who um, is present in the room thank thank you for making time and thank all the uh, speakers, uh, uh, welcome address and keynote speakers, as well as uh, Nehru for his talk to get up, get us off on a good start. Um, we begin with our next talk of uh, today. Um, this is on uh, uh, mangrove research in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, some insights for the way forward. So uh, the idea is that uh, after listening uh, to Nehru from about India, we, we broaden a little bit of, of our focus and, and, and hear from our next speaker, Dr. Bihara Satyanarayana, uh, from his perspective and his research um, from Malaysia and in Southeast Asia. Uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Satyanarayana, who is currently working as Associate Professor at the Institute of Oceanography and Environment, University Malaysia Teng. Terenganu, UMT Malaysia. He started his research career as a mangrove biologist in India in Andhra University and continued studying these wetlands in other Asian countries such as Sri Lanka, China, Malaysia, as well as in African countries like Cameroon and the Gambia. His research interests include mangrove ecology, vegetation dynamics, habitat restoration, conservation management, including remote sensing and GIS applications. He is a member of IUCN Mangrove Specialist Group since 2019 and actively engaged in both mangrove flora and fauna, particularly horseshoe crabs. Uh, <clears throat> 
he has worked uh, collaboratively with a lot of other researchers around the world and he has published uh, several research papers more than 85 he has received several national international scientific awards and recognitions and about 12 research grants through his illustrious uh, throughout his illustrious career we are happy to have you here sir uh, the floor is yours Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rupesh. Hope my screen is clear now. Uh, screen is clear, but can you uh, make it a yeah. full screen, like slideshow? Yes. Yes. Is now it's good. Yeah. Th yes. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, good morning, uh, uh, everyone. Uh, uh, and uh, first of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the organizers of this conference, uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Nehru. The uh, very good invitation introduction given by Dr. Rupesh. Thank you, sir. Uh, actually, it, uh, this this conference is is a place to learn from each other. I would say, of course, uh, though we have been continuing research for a long time, but every, you know, the Magros is the is a natural laboratory. So, so you we, we keep on learning every day uh, from from each other and from the ecosystem itself. So thanks. I'm delighted to today to to join this event uh, uh, with, with together with uh, my my loved uh, professors, uh, colleagues, and uh, like Professor Farid, uh, Professor Katrish, and uh, Professor Punyas Loke, and uh, yes, uh, Professor Daniel and McKenzie, Professor McKenzie. So so it was so nice. It is like another MMM you know conference somewhere. So it is it is very good. And thank you so much. Uh, yes, coming to my talk uh, today, I was requested to say a few words about research in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, in particular um, you know, from Malaysia, where I'm uh, now working, uh, together with some insights for the way forward. Uh, indeed, uh, from the last two days even until this morning, we have been listening to uh, eminent uh, uh, personalities with, with uh, enlightening talks. Uh, they have been concentrating and they have been really uh, revealing the facts that uh, the mangroves, the importance of mangroves for the carbon carrying capacity and also carbon credits and, uh, and the nature-based solutions uh, to mitigate the impacts of climate change and so forth. Uh, so definitely uh, the research, the current research in Southeast Asia is not really uh, is entirely different from what has been uh, you know talking from from last uh, two two days uh, so i don't really need to repeat that one but i try to uh, show you some other concerns which i felt like sharing with you uh, uh, especially in the case of india because uh, my insights they are not going to be presented as a separate section it will be part and parcel of my talk uh, targeted to the indian researchers uh, so that we can have a very good collaboration as 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 a uh, doctor uh, Nehru indicated that collaborations are a bit uh, low. It is a good opportunity. And uh, kindly note that present uh, any of the research findings that I'm showing from Malaysia is, is part of my teamwork carried out between Malaysia, Belgium, Australia, UK. So I'm happy Professor Farid, my brother, uh, is on board today and definitely we try our best to, uh, to, to deliver this talk and uh, uh, answer your questions and see how best we can cooperate in the future for, for the uh, mangrove research uh, for sustainable and conservation. Uh, so, thank you. I am also thankful to some of my students who worked, and uh, I, I don't have place to write so much, uh, so many names. But today, I'm going to say a, a few words about what uh, I felt like sharing. Uh, yes, uh, uh, you all must have seen that uh, FAO has uh, already, uh, you know, evaluated the, uh, the 30 years of data for the global forest data, and also they presented uh, the, uh, the actual mangrove extent, global mangrove extent by 2020 was like 14.8 uh, million hectares. So uh, it, it is a very good uh, to me. It is the most recent estimate, global level estimate that uh, one could differ. And uh, it is it is nice to see always the uh, Asia is the golden spot for our mangrove, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, existence uh, followed by Africa and the Americas and the ocean. Uh, the FAO also uh, give gave some details uh, at the detailed level changes. Uh, between 1990 and 2020, and uh, they were, uh, uh, you know, they, they have come, come up with uh, the detailed changes and the trend of change for each region and sub-region. 
and uh, uh, unfortunately between uh, in, the, in the in the in the last 30 years we lost almost 1 million mangroves hectares mangroves it is very sad part of it but it, but it is true uh, their, their estimates are reliable because when, when i see to 2000 estimates they are almost close to the uh, uh, you know world atlas of mangroves estimates so it is it is reliable estimates which we can depend on uh, yes Overall, the trend of decrease, global loss, mangrove loss is decreasing, but not the case for uh, uh, Asia. So it is it is very sad uh, to see the same kind of figures, uh, uh, you know, uh, for, for, for Asia. Uh, it's, it's very sad to see this, uh, you know, 39, 38, uh, uh, thousands of hectares loss uh, in, the, in the decade level, and uh, it's very sad. As you can understand, you know, most of the publications and uh, as we can witness, I witness uh, the human anthropogenic interventions for this kind of decrease. But what my gut feeling is uh, saying that there is something uh, uh, to be done extra more than looking at the human level. Uh, interventions. So that is nothing but uh, uh, the mangroves that lost due to the coastal erosion. Somehow I feel, I still feel that the mangrove loss to the coastal erosion is a bit undervalued to me. So I think that is the point uh, we really have to catch hold of. It is time to catch hold of and see, see what could be uh, done to mitigate this kind of effect. Uh, effect. So I'm particularly focusing this point uh, because uh, I wanted to just show uh, an area, Kringa Wildlife Sanctuary, which you are familiar and it was in the limelight from the last two days. Uh, it is on the east coast of India. So but in some pockets, I'm surprised to see between 90s and 20, even 800 to 900 meters patch of mangroves was lost into the sea. So it is, it is really a, a remarkable amount of mangroves that were lost. But, uh, we have very good advantage of technology like satellite images. So we really have to make use of it. And that, that part must be highlighted somewhere. Uh, I know uh, when, if you, if you examine uh, area-wise uh, statistics for Kuringa, you may not be able to see most of change because the forestry department and the local NGOs like MS Swaminathan have been carrying, carrying out extensive plantation works. So in the barren areas. So probably this loss is a bit compensated. But the, forest is still keep decreasing from the eastern side. So that means uh, in the places like India, where there is no opportunity, opportunity for the mangroves to grow uh, uh, landward margin, to extend landward margins, definitely they are going to have a coastal squeeze, which could result for not only for the loss of mangrove extent, but also the biodiversity loss. So these points uh, somehow we uh, I, I I felt like definitely because I was my PhD degree was from uh, Kringa mangroves and, and uh, definitely many people of you many of you must be working in the same area so just to try to focus and try to see what could be done in really in such cases not only in Kringa I think there are so many places places we must be losing the extensive mangrove cover like this because of the coastal erosion. Okay, um, uh, you all must have seen the intergovernment panel uh, climate change uh, uh, predictions of sea level uh, uh, raise by year 2100. So you have you must have seen that the east coast of India uh, is uh, having a, a height of uh, 0.5 to two feet height by uh, 2100 year. Uh, it is a bit less than the west coast, uh, but still, I, to me, we we don't have to wait to one zero zero, because when the when you see the situation, what is going on right now? Just five days back, what happened in Vichakapatnam Beach Road? Just five days back, it, 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 I'm saddened to see the place where I paid one year ago with my children. So see how the sea uh, water intruded into that place. So. Also, they have linked so this 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 seawater intrusion of 200 to 300 meters uh, landward uh, to Javed impact, cyclone Javed impact. And that means this area is already susceptible to such kind of climatic change. So we are we are already under under danger zone uh, actually. So right from this seaward edge, I don't think the the sky touching uh, apartments are not very far. I think within 200 250 meters. That's it. So it is almost close to the road. Beach road where people goes for evening walk, morning walk. So that's such kind. So we are already in the danger zone. Uh, but as you know, 
you cannot blame mangrove, mangroves or, or management alone because mangroves have specific zones of for their uh, uh, prevalence and survival. So uh, what we have projected recently, uh, we have to take utmost care when we are disturbing not only mangroves, but also the other natural or planted vegetations or sand dunes. So any part of our uh, anthropogenic activities in relation to the coastal uh, features, we must be very careful, extra careful. Uh, uh, there are the potential barriers uh, to, uh, to mitigate the impact of ocean surface. So this point, everyone has to make note of it uh, to see uh, before we conduct any kind of change to the coastal areas, we really have to uh, go for the uh, thorough, uh, you know, um, criti criti critical analysis to, to bring up any kind of change in the, along the coast. And as you know, that the COP conference 26, uh, uh, most recently, uh, 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 last month, uh, uh, the global leaders have already promised to bring down the deforestation by 2030. It is a very good motive. And our Honorable Prime Minister was to achieve net zero emissions by 2070. Yeah, we as scientists, I strongly believe that our, 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 uh, uh, our impressions, scientific insights should be transparently carried to the policymakers and politicians or, or managers uh, to, to protect these coastal uh, features of vegetation, including the mangrove vegetation, to really combat with, with this, uh, you know, uh, uh, this climate change and so forth. Yes, uh, our uh, keynote address, uh, 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 Dr. Daskuta has, uh, you know, uh, indicated. Uh, it is not only uh, uh, the when we lose the mangroves, it's not only the loss of mangroves. Actually, mangroves are well connected to almost all directly or indirectly to every part of the sustainable development goal. This is the best part of the mangroves. Although they have a major stack for 14 and 13, uh, but still they are, they are playing a, a good role directly or indirectly for other sustainable go development goals. So it is it is our customary to, to really uh, take care of the mangroves uh, to the extent possible. Uh, yes, uh, we noticed uh, from a few of our estimates also, uh, now uh, uh, the global rate is alarming. That's why, uh, not alarming that much, though that's why they say uh, we can go for uh, uh, conservation optimism, but, but in the case of Asia, especially South Asia and Southeast Asia. So we really time to think about these uh, uh, concerns and what uh, still we need to uh, see how it could be balanced the loss of the mangroves or or are or, or there any is there any uh, adaptation grounds that we can still find for the mangrove uh, colonization and so forth it is our responsibility as scientists we have to help the government uh, to take such initiatives. Yeah, this is one of the a very good publication recently come out from the mangrove. Um, uh, the specialist group of IUCN uh, led by Professor Farid. And uh, uh, I, I am also happy to mention that Professor Farid and myself have been working in Mangrove from the last 25 years. We, we, we worked uh, in Coringa, that one we moved to Malaysia, China, we are still continuing. This is just a great partnership work we are going on. And uh, he has highlighted a very good point. That public perceptions really matters for the uh, conservation. Also, some of our keynote uh, uh, address people, they, they have delivered the perceptions. Maybe the perception is very small, but it can make a big impact on the conservation and management. For example, I would say, uh, yeah, mangroves are smelly grounds, or some people view mangroves as a, as a mosquito grounds. But as we scientists, we have to uh, explain the reason behind it. What could be the reason that is making mangroves to get such kind of game? For example, I would explain to you uh, to have a very good uh, explanation for the mangroves uh, are not really the breeding sites of, uh, of sites for mosquitoes, which really harmful for the human health. Uh, you know, in this context, I want to highlight the plastic, which you are uh, deliberately just leaving it into the upstream uh, waters and they are reaching to the downstream and they're catching, uh, catch by the, caught by the mangroves. So mangroves not only catching the sediment, but also catching the plastic debris, like, like even plastic cans, bottles, and, and the discarded fishing nets and so forth. So what happens ultimately, those plastic containers, which receive the rainwater, fresh water, will be helping some mosquitoes, which they breed in the fresh water not in the brackish water, like Aedes albicitis, which is responsible for the spread of dengue, chikungunya, and Zika virus, 
So this kind of the speeches, they breed, they need fresh water. But what we are, we are creating such an environment for them to breed in the banks. So that is what, how we can, we can scientifically, uh, you know, uh, explain to the local community, local people to, to create some sort of awareness, uh, not to have any bad impressions on the mangrove. Uh, and the mangroves, indeed, they are, they are really helping us and they are saving us. So that definitely can bring a change to the con conservation of the mangrove uh, ecosystems. So we really have to, as some, uh, many of uh, you highlighted, the community plays a very strong role. Still, I'm happy to see sometimes even the couch, uh, even television or refrigerator, the mangroves. So probably the mangrove scientists don't need to go for a furniture shop. I think they can go to the mangroves to buy them, to, to just collect the furniture, home furniture. It's very sad, but people are doing it, still doing it some part. And uh, uh, this part, uh, um, yeah, I will explain, I will link up this, this photograph with, uh, uh, after some other, fire, fire, some other uh, part of my talk. Uh, but uh, one point I can say, don't think that my students will work in the mangroves without shirts. Sorry, it, it was a raining time, so that's why they, it was wet, you know, so they removed the shirts and they're continuing the work. So I talked about this, this slide, the story behind this slide after some slides. So overall, uh, yeah, when we look at, uh, uh, most recently there was a one more review on the, on the, on the uh, identification of hotspots mangrove deforestation hotspots in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and South uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, so uh, it is, uh, uh, they have categorized the hotspots into primary hotspots and secondary hotspots. So Myanmar and Philips uh, have a, uh, a, a huge loss of mangroves. That's why they were considered under primary, whereas Malaysia, I'm sad to see my country is still, of course. Uh, so uh, Cambodia and Indonesia, they are still in secondary hotspots. So overall, they, they said that, that the uh, expansion of uh, the agricultural activities and the palm oil plantations are, are becoming threat for the mangrove uh, in, in, uh, in, in most of these countries, uh, which we can, uh, uh, yeah, it is, it is true indeed. Yes, uh, uh, also, I would like to say that, uh, yeah, uh, um, you know, mangroves are social ecological systems. That means physical components, uh, biological components, and social elements are, are, are fit together. They, work, they influence each other. That means the mangroves are the place that open. It's a natural laboratory that opens doors for a wide array of research. You can go right from a simple topic to the most complicated topic, like like most recent carbon estimations and so forth. So there is no limit. It is it is it is you are the only limitation for for, for the mangroves to conduct research. So then uh, it is good that we can go on with the simple research on mangrove species composition, distribution to and you know exploitation and socioeconomics, species environment relationships and the mangrove propagation and conservation and management, pollution aspect, and including marine. Uh, uh, endangered species like like dolphins in the mangroves in in in, in uh, i think many people many places like in Tilka lake or or in uh, uh, sundarban the must be dolphins coming in as well so the same here goes in, in malaysia as well so so out of these topics today i was requested to go for some sort of a remote sensing based observations to share with you uh, as part of i am going to share some findings based on the drone based research as uh, uh, everyone knows drone is a bit uh, is a revolutionary approach uh, you know to uh, to really analyze the mangrove species composition distribution or or coming up with land cover land use uh, mapping so my theme I'm going to share with you today about the remote sensing, which is unmanned aerial vehicles, and many people are known by, by known as as drones, and uh, some people also started calling them as unoccupied aerial vehicles. Uh, so and then uh, I, along with that, I'm going to share some mobiles uh, just to encourage the students or, or the uh, stakeholders uh, for which they don't really need to, 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 to spend a lot of time. They can digitally record uh, the data which they are collecting in the field and that to be used for sharing and that later on useful for their networking, national and international networking. 
Okay, as you know, uh, in the aerial photography, it is more, much more advantage. Uh, uh, aerial Im images much more advantageous than satellite data because aerial photographs we can avoid the cloud cover because you can adjust the time of acquisition of the satellite uh, uh, aerial images. So that is the good advantage. You can do it by flying by helicopters or you can fly the drone the same. So also the resolution, you can really go for the submitter to meters or centimeter levels. You can be adjusted by, by looking at the altitude. So that, that's a wonderful uh, option we have. So that's that's why people started using it and it's become widely popular for the mangrove research nowadays. When you look at the, uh, there are several drone types uh, based on the size, range, platforms and abilities. So you can find the drones from very small uh, to very large. And also the range of flight, you can fly. You need to fly them close, or you need to fly them, uh, you know, mid range or, or or short range, or so forth. And also aerial platforms, you have multi rotors or fixed wing or single rotor, just to balance the, you know, the flight of the uh, the drone. And also the ability for what purpose do, are you going to use the drones? Uh, are they are they meant for the deliveries? You know, nowadays even the medical kits are delivered uh, through the uh, through the drones. Huh? So then then delivery drones and RTK drones and uh, RT drones and so forth. There are so many drones that are available, but you are the one best person to choose what kind of drone you need and what is the object of your study. But, but what finally uh, uh, makes uh, uh, you to decide what kind of uh, uh, drone you need for your research. Uh, in the in the in, in market, there are so many companies are available. But DJ is one of the best uh, company which you can trust upon. And uh, currently, I have the drone of Phantom Three uh, Professional, um, supported by uh, you know from Belgium uh, with Farid. And then uh, we have been using it in, in the mangroves for for, for uh, identification of uh, you know mapping or, or uh, uh, extraction of different uh, biophysical properties. Yeah, this is uh, this is a, a, a drone's uh, view uh, of a mangrove stand. How clear it is, you can see. Uh, especially as you know, we are we all mangrove scientists are struck by the uh, you know sediment uh, exposure during the low tides. So in that case, uh, in some places we can dare to walk in, but some places it is very difficult to walk in. It goes more than this uh, in, inside. So it is very difficult. So then uh, you can immediately take a, a drone to fly over that particular patch uh, to know the real time monitoring uh, to see what is there, along with the different species compositions or different illegal activities. If there are any uh, logging activities are going on currently, your, your real time monitoring is the best advantage you can you can make it. Like uh, satellite data, uh, yeah, drone images, you can see the tonality, texture, structure, shape, size, shape. These are the characteristics that you can uh, be used for the identification of different species uh, and the classification of the image. That means it is almost uh, very good characteristics that, that close to the satellite data. So that, that's a wonderful advantage for us. Uh, this is uh, just RGB camera. I would say this is just RGB camera, like your mobile phone. So, 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 but, but the details are so clear, and the, the abilities are are more advanced for us. So, for this particular presentation, I'm going to show you a short uh, uh, presentation. I mean, short analysis uh, from an area called Situ Wetlands in Malaysia. It is located on the uh, east coast of Peninsular Malaysia, which is about one hour away from my uh, campus. Uh, so. Uh, uh, a uh, study was uh, applied in the place where there is a rich diversity of mangrove species, right? six to 10 species we are located in that particular patch. So we have applied that and the government has declared this particular area as a state park. And uh, the object of our uh, research was something like uh, to test the potential of the drone technology uh, against the satellite data uh, in terms of quality, efficiency, and accuracy quality in terms of uh, spatial, spectral, radiometric, and temporal resolution, efficiency in, the, in terms of coverage area, data acquisition, processing time, and user cost, and accuracy, how finally we can arrive to the land use land cover classification. So this is the uh, interesting one, one image uh, uh, with, with satellite, another one is drone taken, and uh, see how the results uh, we, we have achieved. So uh, we uh, for this presentation, I'm not going to show the entire uh, the wetland. I'm just going to show the results that we acquired uh, from just 12 hectares of 
mangrove area where there is a rich diversity of mangrove uh, species coming. So, of course, although you use satellite data, either it is a spatial uh, satellite data or aerial satellite data, uh, definitely you need to have some ground inventory. But that ground inventory can be minimized because you have a very good spatial coverage of satellite data. So, however, we have covered the extensive ground truthing and we've flown the drone at 100 meters altitude uh, with the flying speed of four meters per second and the photographs taking intervals for every two seconds with 75 overlapping uh, uh, nature. And we have used some free software like uh, uh, Quick, uh, Quick, uh, QGIS and also um, AGSoft for, for the analysis. So I'm going to share some findings uh, in terms of spatial resolution. Uh, when you have a, a pan sharpened uh, um, uh, PLIDOS image, uh, it has a resolution of 50 centimeters, but the drone with the RGB camera, we have a 2.8 centimeters resolution. So it is very excellent, excellent resolution for you to really pinpoint the, the, the features on the, on the land. And uh, spectral resolution, yes, uh, satellite data have an advantage. Uh, in the sense uh, you can have different band uh, information, blue, green, red, uh, infrared band information, but it, which is not really uh, possible with the RGB camera. But in the drones, you can have multi-spectral data, but that costs you more. That depends. So that's why I said there are so many models of the drones which you can select based on your interest and your object of your study and also your financial effort, how much you can pay for a drone. That matters what drone you can buy. So then radiometric resolution, actually it's, uh, uh, it causes very little impact on mangroves because most of the radiometric, uh, uh, higher the radiometric detector, more the advantage for the objects which you are uh, mapping very close in the shadow areas. So mangroves are a bit uh, lucky, we, we, we can still make use of the 8-bit data, which is good enough. And the temporal resolution, yes, lead us, uh, 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 the France satellite, yes, you can, it can revisit. Uh, the same place daily within 24 hours, but uh, you can also use drone every every day. It's like 24 hours, uh, but make sure that your drone is not, if, if your drone is water resistant, it's fine. If not, it, it, you have to stop. Then the cost, uh, it, is, it is something interesting that uh, uh, we, 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 we analyzed uh, how much we paid for it. And then, uh, uh, you know, uh, out of the two, two field works, uh, two, two weeks field work, how much area we got almost like 1.81 square kilometers of the area. area. So, but when we compared that cost, uh, sorry. Dr. Behar? Yes, sir. Anything? Uh, anything? From yeah. You? No, no, I was just saying that, uh, uh, do you have a lot more slides to cover? Because uh, oh, we are- I, I, fi I finished running out of time? Yes, yes, actually. Oh, yeah, it's 11.15 really... already. Oh my God. Five oh minutes God. over. Oh my God, oh my God. Sorry, <laughs> sir, sorry. No, no, it's, no, no. Uh, when I wanted to say something, really, I forget myself indeed. That's my- No, no worry. It was fascinating. Of... Uh, no, I'm if, really so, sad, sad for it. Uh, no, but no. I try to, I to make, try to make it. Can you give me another two, three minutes, please? Yes, yes, please yeah, uh, uh, wrap it up in a minute or so. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah, uh, actually, this when we look at the cost of the uh, drone images, uh, yeah, it is expensive than the satellite data, but you need to use the drones for a long time. So at least 500 times, if you can fly, the cost of the image acquisition could go low. Uh, anyway, drone images have bigger file size, that's where your processing time is more, but you can go for the segmentation process to come down. And uh, yeah, you can observe dominant and non-dominant classes uh, for which you can use it for uh, uh, object-based and pixel-based classifications. They are really giving a very good result for, for, the, for the mangroves. And uh, as I said, biophysical properties, which you can observe like pre height you can apply the canopy height model, even uh, for, for most of the area without doing any ground analysis. So, uh, but ground analysis in some pockets will be useful for you to compare uh, the other city. So what we found is uh, in the case of the area which I examined, the managed forest has very close values to the drone. Uh, canopy height models when compared to the non-managed forest, probably because of the heterogeneity in the forest. Also, you are able to uh, obtain the biomass estimates. Overall, as I said, the drone is a one-cost, one-time investment. Over the usage of long-term, it can be 
make, make give you very good uh, results. But in the case of India, you really have to think of uh, regulations uh, which are released in 2021 for your ISS. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to go uh, for the uh, mobile apps, uh, right from the identification of the species, there are several mobile apps are available for students to download. And also nowadays, there is a uh, F track, which you can upload the uh, live data, I mean, um, real time data, and you can submit uh, uh, through the online platform, uh, which can be uh, shared uh, among the research investigators nationally and internationally interested. It is not open to everybody. So only the password, uh, uh, there will be a password, uh, you can use it uh, for the restrictions. And uh, we have did this kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, capacity building training to Malaysia, so we can do that exercise as well. So make sure that uh, management always have stakeholders inside. Uh, irrespective of the age, you can make a lot of change. So there is also one more software, Glama, which you can use it for gap light analysis, which is very, mu very much important for you to see the nutrient dynamics and regeneration capacity. And also the tide, the tree heights, you can use a global map. And uh, make sure that you always keep encouraging uh, ecotourism, field schools, and ecotourism uh, to promote the mangrove studies. Involve students, most importantly, involve the students for the plantations for it. So community-based uh, management is going to rock. And also, we have so many celebrities in India. Definitely, we have to make them ambassadors to, to, to benefit the uh, mangrove conservations. So, so let us join hands to protect the mangrove treasure through improved national and international research collaborations. Thank you very much. And sorry for extend, extending my time. And really, uh, pardon me. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you, Dr. Bahira, and, and thank you for ending at such an inspiring note. It's a shame your uh, last part of presentation was really worth uh, inspiring and interesting, and we couldn't have a longer time. But I'm I'll happy to, to announce that your presentation will be at the website. And so people uh, who are interested to know more about mangroves and these uh, mobile apps that you, you shared uh, can uh, know more from your presentation and hopefully will include them in advancing their research. So thank you so much for sharing all this new advancement. Thank it, you. It will be thank very, you. very, 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 very sincere, helpful. My sincere apologies, my sincere apologies. No, no worries, Dr. Vera. You took us for a longer drive and we enjoyed it. Just the time is not with us. So without further ado, uh, let us uh, move to our next uh, session. Um, that is a panel discussion. We have uh, uh, three um, uh, experienced researchers, scientists in their own might to share their perspectives, to share their uh, views on mangrove research, and also take us to uh, to some new territories, the topics that we have not discussed, uh, like uh, what Dr. Behera just discussed uh, about drones and mobile apps. We have um, researchers who will also shed light on some other unexplored, relatively unexplored or limited explored areas of mangrove research. So we have a little bit tweaking in the program. I'll first call our uh, uh, um, panel member, Dr. Richard McKenzie. Then I'll call Professor Punsilo Padri, whom you heard yesterday also. And then lastly, I'll call Dr. Uh, Shilpa Pandey. We'll have a brief presentations or, or a, a small um, talk by them, and then we will open up uh, the discussion. And uh, this is very crucial. It's the last day. This is, gives us uh, time for discuss some of the ideas, new things. So I'll really request all the speakers to keep their initial comments brief, and then we'll open up for more conversations, more question and answer, and more discussion. So without further ado, let me invite Dr. Rich McKenzie. Uh, in terms of his, his introduction, he is a uh, works for U.S. Forest Service at Institute of Pacific Island uh, Forestry in Hilo, Hawaii, as well as International Program Office uh, of United States Forest Service in Washington, D.C. So I, I must also thank him for uh, keeping awake at this late hour and being with us in life. Thank you so much, Dr. Rich. He has published several papers uh, and research articles. And uh, since 2003, he's been working with USFS uh, and also um, as a part of USFS international programs, he helps oversee the Sustainable Wetland Adaptation Mitigation Program, the SWAM program that Professor Daniel Mordiaso gave a, a little introduction. Um, Rich is uh, an important uh, team member in that part. And last but not least, Rich loves Indian cuisine and he loves <laughs> Indian mangrove. So with that, Rich, uh, over to you. Thanks, Rupesh, and thanks uh, for inviting me uh, to present. 
Uh, it's an honor to be here. So good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. I'm going to see if I can get this to work. Uh, can you see my uh, my screen? Yes. Great. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, so uh, yeah. So this is work that has uh, uh, come resulted from the Swamp project that uh, Puck Daniel mentioned uh, earlier. It's a collaboration between the Forest Service, C4, and and USAID. Uh, I'm going to talk today about the value of establishing permanent mangrove plots and how data from these plots has advanced our understanding of mangrove forests. And I have to thank Dr. Nehru uh, for his presentation because he led perfectly into my presentation on, on the lack of monitoring data uh, for India. And, and so I'm going to talk about uh, the value of long-term monitoring and, and um, why are we interested in setting up permanent plots? Why, why do we need them? Uh, so first, uh, as you are all probably aware of mangrove forests can store more carbon than most other forested ecosystems. So using a standard protocol uh, such as SWAMP, the SWAMP protocol, which uh, adheres to the UNFCCC protocol in that it's transparent, accurate, complete, comparable, and consistent, um, which we also refer to as the TAC principle. So using the SWAMP pr uh, protocol, uh, you can use permanent plots to track how carbon stocks change with time by remeasuring trees, by remeasuring annual inputs of leaf litter, by measuring below ground root growth, or by measuring below ground root decomposition. Because our uh, principles follow the TAC, our, because our protocol follows the TAC principles, we can compare measurements across plots or across a uh, country or region. So uh, for example, in this uh, example here, remeasurements of, a permanent, of permanent plots on the Pacific Island reveal that not all mangroves are equal. And so on the y-axis, we've got our above ground carbon accumulation and the x-axis are our sites. And you can see that there is some variability in the rate at which carbon is being sequestered in these in, uh, in these forests. So this is valuable information uh, when you are setting up a, um, a, a greenhouse gas inventory or a forest inventory. And this measurement is also referred to as the growth rate or also the stock change approach. And these numbers are, are valuable because they can be used for higher tier estimates and national reports uh, in that they increase the accuracy, uh, the precision, and the confidence in the data. And Pak Daniel also referred to the 2013 uh, wetland supplement and information like this can be used uh, uh, by the government in India or by other governments uh, to increase the confidence in the tier of the data that they're reporting, uh, as well as when they use um, this wetland supplement. Now tree growth rates, uh, when you add uh, leaf litter fall to it, gives you what, uh, what, we're, what we call net primary productivity or NPP. And when you combine this with net ecosystem respiration rates, you can calculate net ecosystem productivity. Uh, and this is the amount of carbon that the forest is gaining or losing. Um, and in these photos here, uh, Dr. Sahadev Sharma, a good colleague of mine, is setting out respiration chambers uh, in a mangrove and in a deforested mangrove that's now a, a abandoned shrimp pond. And he's measuring, uh, and these chambers are attached uh, to, so you can see the chambers here. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Uh, they are attached to a greenhouse gas analyzer that allows us to uh, continually measure carbon dioxide and methane and allows us to estimate um, net ecosystem respiration. Of course, a better way to measure um, respiration would be through the use of an eddy covariance flux tower, as you can see in these pictures here. And I believe this is a, a flux tower from India. Uh, um, and these should be considered if, if you are establishing permanent plots uh, because they give you a better estimate of respiration and, and of uh, greenhouse gas flux from the forest uh, because they're located above the canopy and they include the entire ecosystem. So here's an example for some data we collected from some permanent forest plots. And so in this example, if we only looked at carbon stocks, you would see that intact mangroves 
store about 60 micrograms of carbon dioxide per hectare per year, which is two to three times more carbon than that that is stored in deforested mangroves or in restored mangroves. When we calculate net ecosystem productivity, however, we see a different story. So now this intact mangrove, when we add, uh, include this respiration, we see that the net ecosystem productivity is 10.6 megagrams of carbon of hect uh, per hectare per year, while the deforested mangrove is a source of carbon uh, releasing 18.3 megagrams of carbon per hectare per year. And the restored sites are uh, sequestering 12.7 megagrams of carbon per, per hectare per year. So the res this restored site, this younger site, is sequestering more carbon than this older intact forest. And this is important, again, from a management perspective and a conservation perspective as we move forward uh, to protect and restore these incredibly valuable ecosystems. Now, the second benefit, uh, the second reason why it's important to establish permanent uh, monitoring plots is uh, sea level rise. Uh, we know that sea level is rising and it has been identified as the greatest future threat to mangroves. But fortunately, we also know that mangroves are incredibly dynamic ecosystems and they've survived extreme fluctuations in sea level rise over the last 65 million years. How have they done this? Primarily through the ability of mangrove forests to increase the height of their forest floor relative to sea level. And this is accomplished by two main processes, accretion and root growth. Now accretion happens when sediment is deposited on the mangrove forest floor. Uh, so when the ocean uh, floods the mangrove, when the tides come into the mangrove forest, uh, when an adjacent river floods the mangrove forest, that water flows through the, uh, across the surface of the mangrove. And when it hits those root systems, those above ground roots, the water slowed in such a way that sediment is deposited out onto the surface. Uh, and of course, root growth is just the massive amounts of fine roots that mangroves uh, will grow. And this is because mangroves grow in anaerobic waterlogged sediments. And in order to survive those conditions, they have to continually replace fine root systems. And so we have a really high below ground productivity level in these mangrove forests. Now, as the sediment is, is uh, layering on, onto the top of the mangrove forest, and as the roots are growing, we see an increase in soil volume. So soil volume expands and it allows the forest floor to rise. Of course, uh, subsidence, uh, and compaction are two processes that can counter soil volume uh, accumulation uh, in such a way that uh, in some instances, the mangroves actually will sink or subside. So as I said, permanent plots can help us track how mangroves are responding to sea level rise. Well, how, how do we track that? Well, we monitor how the surface elevation of the mangrove is changing relative to sea level rise. And we are, are doing this using three main tools. And I'm going to uh, show you this example here. This is the island of Pompeii in the Western Pacific. And this is part of our Pac-Man project, which is the Pacific Island Mangrove Monitoring Network. And so the first tool that we use is LED 210. This is a naturally occurring radionuclide that is continually being deposited out of the atmosphere onto the Earth's surface. And we go into the mangroves, uh, we collect a core here, as you can see Maybelline on the right, uh, and we section that core into continuous intervals. And those intervals are then returned back to the lab and we extract uh, the lead 210 from the sediment using a hot acid digestion. And then we measure how much lead 210 are in those intervals using alpha spectrometry. And then simply uh, using the law of radioactive decay, we can uh, determine, um, well, first of all, we determine the level of lead 210 in each uh, increment, as you can see in this graph here. Um, and then we can use the, the law of radioactive decay to age each interval. Once we know how old the interval is, we can calculate the elevation change in millimeters per year. Second method that we use is referred to as rod surface elevation tables or R sets. And you can see in this cartoon here, this is an example of an R set that has been installed in a mangrove. 
And so uh, what you do, uh, and I, I didn't say it was easy to install an R set, uh, but you have to haul a generator and an incredibly heavy jackhammer, as well as incredibly heavy rods into the mangrove forest. You jackhammer these rods through the peat until you hit a point of refusal, which is this basalt or this fossil coral underneath the mangrove. I uh, then concrete that into place and return with this arm. This SCT arm attaches to the rod and then you lower these nine fiberglass pins through the arm until the pin rests on the forest floor. Uh, you then measure the height of the pin above the arm uh, over time. And so you can either measure the, the pins will rise or they will fall and you measure that uh, to calculate uh, elevation change in a mangrove forest. This is an example of some data that we collected from uh, that island Pompeii and the sap wall of mangrove. Uh, the blue line represents uh, sea level and you can see it's uh, gradually increasing over time. But you can also see we've got three plots. Uh, our interior, uh, which is, appears to be keeping up with sea level rise, uh, and our riverine and fringe, which are not. Uh, so this interior site, uh, since it's keeping up with, with sea level, we consider it to be resilient and it should be prioritized for conservation while the riverine and the fringe uh, would require uh, more active restoration. Uh, the third method that we're using is brand new. Uh, and I think this is the state of the future for measuring surface elevation change in mangroves. And this is using a compact biomass LIDAR, LIDAR system, which is a light uh, detector and ranging system. So you've already installed an R set system into the mangrove. And so you can attach this LIDAR unit to the, the set, and then the laser can scan an entire plot in a matter of minutes. And you can collect uh, anywhere up to 100,000 points with each scan. Because the scans are lasers, we're no longer relying on human accuracy or error to lower those pins onto the surface. So we increase our precision and we increase our accuracy. And this is an example of a result from one of these plots uh, where you can see these warmer yellow areas represent areas that the mangrove is increasing in elevation and these cooler uh, blue areas represent areas where they are decreasing. So those are three methods that we use uh, to measure elevation. And then just lastly, wanna wrap up here. Uh, so we took the data from these plots. We had 48 permanent plots we installed on this one island. And we used all of that information, uh, the forest plot data, the carbon data, the carbon burial data, and the elevation change data and we, we built a vulnerability assessment of the mangroves using a warmer model, which stands for the wetland accretion rate model for ecosystem resilience. And so the model looks at the current extent of mangroves. So you can see this current map here in the upper portion of the slide, the different colors correspond to different mangrove species. And then we looked at how those changed uh, over time under various sea level rise scenarios. In this case, we used the 117 centimeters by 2100. You can see there's not a lot of change by 2060, but once we get into 2080, all these red species appear, which is Rhizophora stylosa, and by 2100, we actually see some loss of mangroves, which are the black shaded areas. So there's still some time to uh, implement some management to possibly counter uh, the impacts from sea level rise on this island. So I'd like to conclude then with permanent mangrove monitoring plots can provide information uh, excuse me, they can provide information uh, needed for better management of mangroves and for the continued provision of goods and services that so many people rely on. They also provide, and I think this is key, uh, valuable education experiences for students, scientists, conservations, and most importantly, decision and policy makers. And so I think this is something, uh, as uh, Dr. Nehru had said in his presentation, there's, there isn't a lot of long-term monitoring data uh, in India, and I think it would be a great idea to start to collect some of this, this long-term data. So I thank you for your time. I think I went a few minutes over. I apologize, Rupesh, um, and I will hand it back to you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you very much for uh, not only sharing some new cool ideas about how do we measure elevation change in mangrove ecosystem, uh, but also showing uh, or sharing the importance of mangrove themselves, how they cope up with the sea level rise and why we need to have better understanding of the mechanism behind it if we understand it better if we have better ways to monitor it measure it then we can perhaps be better prepared to handle it so thank you so much um th these are 
cool new advancements and i i think this is also pertinent because uh, in our last two days discussions uh, we didn't touch upon uh, too much of like methods and new new techniques and the importance of permanent monitoring uh, plots or, or time series data is something that we did touch upon and that is uh, uh where, where the the second speaker in this session comes in uh professor punsilo padri he has uh, uh, been working in sundarbans and had maintained a long term um monitoring of at least water quality parameters and other things and he's here to share his thoughts uh, so i will briefly introduce him because there may be some news um, attendees who have joined today so oh, for the interest, I will uh, reintroduce uh, Professor Badri to, uh, for today's session. He is a professor at ISER Kolkata, um, and he leads the Center for Climate and Environmental Studies, which is an interdisciplinary center on earth and environmental sciences with societal relevance. Um, uh, as you can see, mangroves fit in there very well. He's a recipient of the prestigious Swan Jayanti Fellowship Award in area of earth and environmental sciences by government of India in 2019. And his research interest include biocomplexity of microbial system, including in mangroves, biogeochemical cycling and sea level rise, nature-based solutions to ecosystem restoration and developing technologies for biomonitoring of coastal biotopes. He has published uh, more than 80 peer reviewed articles. So uh, Professor Badri, uh, we are open to hear your uh, wise and insightful comments and thoughts. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Bunia. Oh, it's very kind of you. I hope you can see the slides, maybe? Yes, it's yeah. uh, clear. Yeah, please go okay. ahead. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, I have, uh, I, what I'll talk about or share my thoughts about, uh, you know, in, in this small uh, talk is, uh, uh, as uh, Richard has already mentioned, some of the new interesting insights the techniques and the approaches that you can take, but also putting into context uh, from the uh, Indian mangrove research viewpoint, because there are a lot of other factors that also plays a very important role. Uh, our research must align with the economics of the country. The socioeconomics is, is something that is very important. So we have to, you know, you look into that aspect also. So uh, I, I have identified two areas that I think is important, but of course, you know, this is never the comprehensive. I think it was already highlighted that why time series monitoring is very important. So we should have a lot more uh, time series monitoring sites in, in different mangroves uh, of India. And I think that that comparison is required to uh, understand the dynamics, normalization of the data. That is something which is a big issue, I think, uh, between the east and west coast of, of India in certain aspects. The second thing is the environmental DNA biomonitoring. I think uh, that is something which, which we need to really work very hard upon and emphasize because now the technologies are so robust uh, that we can actually biomonitor uh, quite a big area, you know, in a small amount of time. And the depth of information that we get is really huge, where from you can deduce a lot more uh, in, in information and then integrate those information into policy making decisions. So, so that linkage is very important. The third thing is uh, automation is very important. You know, there are sites and areas uh, in many mangroves, for example, in, in Sundarbans or in Peter Kanikor, even in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Where actually physically going down and sampling uh, can be a challenge, uh, you know, uh, because of uh, logistic issues. But I think if we can take the help of automation, I think uh, that would play a very, very important role. Of course, it requires a lot more calibration and readjustment, taking into account the local factors and settings. Um, we need to integrate automation with relative sea level rise uh, measurements. I think that is something which is not much we are getting from. Uh, from Indian subcontinent, I mean more from the in situ measurements. That's what I mean. Uh, of course, we are all the data that we are deducing are from the satellite based uh, deductions. The fourth one is citizen science led by local communities. I think this is something which we can play very, very important role. There are millions of people who are living in the, in the mangrove fringes, and they can be, you know, they're very intelligent. Their knowledge is much stronger than, than me, at least. And we can actually work with them and, and get a depth of information. Uh, that would be very, very important. 
And then the last one, which I've said that emerging areas, for example, already it got highlighted by uh, Dr. Behera before, and also Nehru has highlighted microplastics. Uh, the other one is heat waves. And the last one, last according to me, not the least, of course, ocean acidification, uh, coastal ocean acidification is a big uh, issue that we don't understand. So we have a time series site. Uh, it's more than a decade now. Uh, so this is the Indian part of the Sundarbans. And our time series site is on the westernmost part of the Sundarbans. So down south of the westernmost part of Sundarbans. And uh, the reason for having this time series site on the westernmost part is, of course, you know, we wanted to look at the influence of the of the Bay of Bengal on the on the mangrove ecosystem and, and biogeochemical processes. So therefore, that actually played a very important role. So we have three stations that we keep monitoring, uh, you know, since 2010. It's the weekly monitoring we have. And uh, we look at wa water, sediment, uh, you know, vegetation data also. Uh, and uh, this data set is actually available for anybody to use it. And so, so I'll, I'll send you the link of that. So you can download the data and use it uh, for your purpose because we think in situ validation with remote sensing is required and this data can might be of some help. Uh, also, there are a lot of other factors are there like human habitation, aquaculture farms. So we wanted to look, the, look at the effects of those on the time series uh, site. And so that you can deduce a more bigger picture of, of, of what is going on in, in the Sundarbans. Now, as I said yesterday and showed yesterday, this is the kind of data that you get, you know, for example, here I plotted the uh, salinity data you know, uh, throughout the year. And you can see for, for 10 years almost is plotted and you can see the oscillations are there. But what is interesting to note is that actually between 2010 and, and 2019 or 20, the salinity has shifted. It has become more marine than yeah, what estuary actually. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is that the freshwater flow, uh, which is coming through this part of the island, the Sagar Island, uh, from the river Ganga, the major uh, distributor is Muri Ganga, that is decreasing. So it's a more saline condition which is prevailing. So, so the effect on the vegetation, we are also seeing, we're seeing more uh, marine tolerant species that are, that are actually appearing in the system compared to the ones uh, that we typically find in, in Sundarbans. Now, another important thing is the time series data can give a much bigger understanding of the kind of uh, changes that might be happening. Here, what you have done is, I'm showing you as an example here, here we have plotted the nitrogen, for example. And in this case, of course, is uh, we have plotted the nitrate and you can see that the nitrate also uh, shows an oscillation. But in course of time, the nitrate shows the variability and we now know that most of this nitrogen that's coming in the system from the breakdown of organic matter is actually anthropogenically derived nitrogen. So more ammonia and are coming into the system with anthropogenic origin and that you have deduced based on stabilized uh, you know, measurements. So, so then what is the response of, of, of this so much nitrogen that is there in the system? Uh, well, we, we can look at the microbial communities. These are the surface water microbial communities. They, they do a lot of the processes uh, at, at the benthic pelagic level also. So here you, you can see one thing about the Sundarban system is, of course, it's a proteobacteria dominated system, but you have got a lot of uh, delta proteobacteria, typical signal of freshwater. Uh, but we are now seeing a shift of that freshwater into alpha proteobacteria, which is more marine. And we are now able to uh, deduce or able to identify areas in the Sundarbans based on the microbial signature and the nitrogen signature. So now we deduce the areas of high nitrogen and low nitrogen areas in Sundarbans. So, so, so this, we think the time series is playing a very important role because this data set has been very important for us to understand. Uh, the other aspect I wanted to highlight is, you know, uh, when you look at biological and try to link with product, production, primary production, for example, the aquatic one, uh, we tend to forget about a group called cyanobacteria, you know, and our, our studies of the time series side has shown that cyanobacteria can be very important players in certain times of the year. They can fix about 0.48 to 14.75 grams of carbon per meter square per year, you know, so, and that is, of course, a seasonal, at this particular season. So, so they are very important players, and this is something you know which has been missed out. The eDNA monitoring has uh, kind of helped us to understand because now uh, doing this work, we also have a better understanding of the fish stock, the nursery ground, the, the 
the feeding grounds, how, how the productivity is changing in that area. So, so this kind of information becomes very prominent. Uh, we did not stop out here. I mean, we have moved more eastward of the Sundarbans. And here, what we have done is we are monitoring the tiger habitats of Sundarbans. You know, when you talk about Sundarbans, that swamp tiger uh, is there. It's something which is very charismatic species. And, and here we are monitoring 230 stations in the eastern part of Sundarbans, okay? And we are using completely biological uh, eDNA-based approaches. Of course, microscopy is also there, but this is giving us a, a much better understanding. Here on the left-hand side, you can see the contour maps of the salinity profiles in different times of the year. Upper one is in the uh, pre-monsoon and the lower one is in the post-monsoon season. So, so to understand, the, what is the carrying capacity of this of this uh, landscape and waterscape in terms of tiger habitat or, or tiger? Uh, <clears throat> we are developing that. So eDNA protocol is becoming very very important in this. Uh, I talked about the sensors yesterday also a little bit. Uh, I think we have to develop sensors which will which will fit into this system because there are impediments that there you cannot transfer the data remotely. You have to store the data. Uh, network is an issue out here. So. So we have developed some sensors that we are validating and we're getting some information, initial sets of information of how the, for example, the, the salinity trends are changing in, in, in terms of the tidal regime. And we are working on that at the moment. So, so I think that integration will become very, very important. Now, uh, Dr. Behera mentioned about uh, the cyclones, you know, in, in, in the Bay of Bengal, the cyclones are becoming very prominent. Uh, we are linking the effect of the cyclones with, with some charismatic species. When you talk about Sundarbans, for example, we think of tigers, but actually it's also the habitat of a keystone species, the uh, horseshoe crab, you know, which has not really changed in the last 250 million years. They have survived, but the dinosaurs have gone extinct. So we are trying to understand how the habitat of the horseshoe crab is affected and, and can we deduce information of climate and sea level rise here we are taking a completely different approach. It's a citizen science approach. You're involving the fisher folk communities. So I think this is something which is, be, which is going to become very, very important in the long run uh, to get the information. Uh, and what they are doing is they are, we provide them with a, with a cell phone and whenever they get any uh, horseshoe crab in inhabitant, they take the photo, they share the information, they call. So, so our depth of information is becoming more and more uh, important. The other aspect is to train the young minds so here on the right hand side, you can see what we have done is we have done tagging of the uh, geotagging of the plastics that are found in the mangroves. You know, one example, and and we are developing uh, an index of you know what the plastic distribution is. So this is completely a citizen uh, science driven project. It started after the cyclone, yes, and and it's still continuing. A very enthusiastic bunch of young uh, early researchers and and common citizens were involved in this. Uh, process. Now I come to the end of it uh, in the priority areas. I think one of the important thing is you need to engage with the stakeholders. As scientists, we need to get engaged with the stakeholders. And here in this case, what we do is we routinely engage with the panchayas, the gram panchayas, because they are the ones who implement many of the things on the ground, or they are the ones who see the kind of changes that are happening. And uh, we are working with the gram panchayat, the forest department, the national government, trying to declare within the Sundarbans, ecologically sensitive areas. So this is something, a new concept that you're working on, uh, which is outside the biosphere reserve, but actually you can, we find a lot of biodiversity and a uh, lot of economic value is there. So we are working with, with, with the team. So here citizen science is a very, very important uh, aspect. Last, I, I know I've taken a lot of time. I want to end up that Ocean acidification is a big problem. We have just established the South Asian Regional Hub on Ocean Acidification. Uh, is, is being supported by the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, IAEA and UNESCO. And you've got the, all the BOB rim countries, including Malaysia uh, in, in this effort. So seven countries from Oman to Malaysia are involved. And we are developing the uh, 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 regional framework of ocean acidification uh, measurement that will help understand or improve the blue economy. And there are some work is there. I want to end up with the last point with my colleagues in Iframar in, in France, we are now embarking up on a very ambitious work, automation and artificial intelligence in benthic funnel research. 
so this is something which we are uh, we were working upon uh, and mangrove benthic fauna is something that is very underrepresented and automation is going to play an important role so so i've tried to give some idea uh, uh, what the emerging areas are and what should be done and you are welcome to visit the site of our time series site take the data We'd be, we are very welcome and uh, we welcome collaborations and uh, take we can uh, this cross talk and uh, thank you so much uh, for listening and thank you dr bhumia for patiently not stopping me from from that uh, talk so thank you so much thank you dr badri i came very close to to calling you out but your your presentation was interesting and i think everyone was uh, glued to that so i i hesitated uh, so thank you for sharing uh, your insights and and the work you've been doing uh, particularly of importance is the the new south asian center for monitoring ocean acidification as well as uh, your long term monitoring uh, in sundarbans indeed we are here to to sort of galvanize uh, more collaborate more uh, partnerships and collaborations and uh, with the the topics that have been covered with the research that we has been presented and and more so looking toward future i think we have a lot of reasons to believe that this will indeed result in uh, more integrative more collaborative research and partnership so with that i would like to to invite our uh, next panel member uh, who will um, take us to an entire new uh, direction or dimension of mangrove research. Our next speaker is Dr. Shilpa Pandey. She is a scientist at the Birbal Sahani Institute of Paleo Sciences, Lucknow. So as the title indicates, uh, we are going to learn about history of mangroves. And Dr. Badri just mentioned about horseshoe crab in these mangrove ecosystem. The dinosaurs have gone away, but they have survived. This also tells about the uniqueness of of the the species that are there so i believe uh, dr shilpa pandey will say, share some of insights in looking in the past how past can inform uh, future uh, she is uh, uh, working or her research interest include paleoclimatology paleoecology vegetation dynamics sea level changes and ethnobotany she has significantly contributed on high resolution paleontological record from eastern and western coast regions of India to reconstruct late quaternary vegetational climatic dynamics and paleo sea level change with reference to mangroves. Uh, I'm very excited because these are topics and these are words we have not heard in the conference so far. In the last three days, no one used these words. So I'm excited to learn something new and how we can improve that. So there is a very detailed, uh, very long, illustrious career um, of Dr. Uh, Pandey. Uh, it's all available on our website. To save time, I'm inviting her to, to go ahead with her presentation. Over to you, Dr. Shitpa Pandey. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rupesh. And uh, very good morning to all the panel members and participants over here. First of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity uh, am I audible? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Very clear. Yeah. Okay. So thank you once again. So today, as Dr. Rupesh, Rupesh has uh, talked about that, I'm going to talk on paleoecology, that too, with a special reference to Indian mangroves. Uh, say, uh, before I start to share that for the last 13 years, I have been working in different parts of mangroves area. And so I'm just going to share my few experiences with you. As uh, uh, everybody knows that the ecology is uh, to study the complex relationship between the living organisms and that to with environment. And what paleoecology? That means the study of the uh, ecology in the past. So what is paleoecology uh, especially talks about or is useful for us? Because with the help of the paleoecology, we can reconstruct the biota that lived in the past, that the plants and animals too. And we can also reconstruct the communities that lived in the past, and we can talk about the past landscapes, ecosystems. Therefore, it is very, very important to take uh, into consideration. Biological, geochemical, and other uh, proxies from natural archives helps us to reconstruct ecological and evolutionary systems deep into the past. Similarly, 
If you would like to understand how ecosystem have responded in the past disturbances and other uh, parts like uh, evaluating their resilience to protection, uh, protections and defining their pre anthropogenic variability, the paleoecology plays very, very important role. And at the same time, if you would like to identify and understand the ecological and evolutionary process, so we need to understand the paleoecology and we need to do the paleoecological studies. And if you would like to integrate all the analysis at a point, then it can reveal the unexpected legacies of extinction events on current ecosystem, which we cannot do all alone with the modern system. So here there are a few stages in paleoecological study. First, we need to define the research problem, then choose the site, proper site where we can uh, uh, take up the paleoecological studies, and then we need to collect the samples and uh, based on the collection, we need to have the microfossils and macrofossil studies and which can help us to reconstruct the organisms, populations, communities. And finally, we can talk on the lines of the ecosystem and landscapes and the past environments. So here uh, uh, you can see that uh, before we collect the samples, we need to understand the vegetation cover, present day vegetation cover in that particular area. And then with the help of the corers or trenching method, we do collect the samples from the field. So here uh, you can easily see that we can collect uh, the samples from the lakes, lagoons, and then we uh, take the samples. Or on the field also we do uh, the subsampling, we take the samples to the labs and with the help of the chemical processing, we identify and we they extract the pollen spores and other microfossils. And then we, uh, we do identify under the microscope, then we do the quantification and the uh, and then gradually we reconstruct the uh, paleo environment and past vegetation. So there are a few types of paleo, uh, paleoecological proxies or the evidences. In case of the biological proxies, we do use the pollen spores, diatom, cyanoflagellates, foraminifera, and others too, like phytolates also we do uh, 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 use as a proxy for doing the paleoecological studies. And if you talk about the physical proxies, we do generally use the GeoChemistry, paleomagnetism, uh, uh, paleomagnetism, isotope, LOI, and radiocarbon dating. Especially radiocarbon datings we do use to fix the chronology of the sediment. So there are certain advances uh, uh, in paleoecology. So like uh, if in order to understand the effect of climate change on biodiversity, we should know how diversity from a species to ecosystem react to past climatic changes. So we need to understand uh, some of the molecular methods as Dr. Professor Bahadri has talked about uh, uh, this uh, environmental DNA studies. So various molecular methods and proxies are available to infer the past communities, especially meta barcoding and meta genomics, which can take us, which can uh, talk about the paleoecology in the past. And by sequencing ancient DNA from sediments or fossils, we can reconstruct local dynamics of microbes too. And there are other biomarkers like leaf rexes, fatty acids, and chlorophyll related pigments, which can provide ways to infer prior environmental conditions. So, likewise, by using the molecular methods and some of the traditional paleoecological proxies, we can talk on or we can infer the past ecology. So, uh, if we see the history of the mangroves or how the mangroves have appeared in the past and how long. So uh, we can say, and most of the participants, I hope uh, they are aware that the first recorded mangrove is the palm, uh, Naipa fruticans, and it aged around 75 million years ago. And another uh, most important uh, mangrove that is a fern acrosticum aureum, which diverged during the late Cretaceous time period. And if you talk about the rhizophora, which we generally, which is a very, very common mangrove species. So it has a window of 47.8 to 54.6 million. So similarly, the all, most of the mangrove ancestors were presumably submerged by sea level rise during the warm period and they adapted to intertidal conditions. 
So uh, similarly, the Xylocarpus started diverge from its terrestrial relatives, say around 19.4 million years, and Acanthus diverge, say around 16.8 million years. So as we all know that the mangroves are very, very important uh, and very different from other terrestrial ecosystems because of their root architectures. So these mangroves, especially in terms of the paleoecology or the paleo uh, environmental studies, why these mangroves are important? Because with the help of this root system, they trap the sediments very easily, including uh, pollen spores and other biotic proxies also get trapped with the help of these roots. And they easily get uh, preserved in the geological column and which provides the clue to the environmental and climatic conditions in the past. As we all know that the mangroves are very, very sensitive to the sea level changes. They grow on the shoreline and the shoreline movements get as is uh, very much associated with the sea level rise and fall. So mangroves moves landward and seaward with res respective to the transgression and regression. And because of this, they are very good indicators of the sea level fluctuations. And uh, and because of this also, they are called the dancing ecosystem. So here, uh, in order to the paleoecological studies, uh, I have uh, used the pollen spores as the biotic proxies. And why pollen spores? Because it can tell you about the past vegetation and the past mm -hmm. climate. So with the help of the uh, different pollen aperture size, shapes, and structuring and wall structures, we can identify, I mean to say that based on the morphological variations, we can identify the different species uh, from the sediments. So just I'm going to share one of, uh, one of few case studies from the Indian mangroves. So I have been working in Sundarbans and I have covered most of the parts of Sundarbans, especially some of the core areas also. And uh, uh, like uh, Neti Dupani, Sudan Nikhali, Pakharala, and such Nikhali. And uh, other than mangroves, I'm also working in the Bhitar Karnika to understand the modern pollen vegetation relationship and also the past vegetation changes and development and dynamics of the mangroves ecosystem in this area. Uh, most of the speakers have uh, talked about the Indian uh, Sundarbans, so I'm not going into details of it. So in order to understand the modern pollen vegetation relationship, we have collected different surface samples from the entire Sundarbans, and we found that the pollen analysis of the surface sample shows the pollen spore deposition is very, very compatible with the actual floristics of the area. So uh, recently in 2000, 18 and 19, I published uh, uh, papers on the modern pollen distribution from the Sajnikhali and Pakirala. And there is another paper published from Pakirala by the Haidt and Beheling in 2008. So if anybody is interested to work on the paleoecological studies from Sundarvan, so they can refer these papers. And uh, for the past vegetation and the mangrove to understand the mangrove development dynamics, we are also working on the Chirkhali and the Kaikhali uh, areas of Sundarbans. So likewise, we do collect up to three meter, five meter, as you can see in the picture that uh, by the trenching method, we had collected uh, uh, coal or the near about three to 3.5 meter teeth. And if you can go more deeper, that is very good for the paleoecologists to have the more and more deeper reports. So <clears throat> there is another case study from the Chilka Lagoon and that too from the Holocene time period. So as we all know that the Chilka Lagoon uh, is divided into four sectors and the another sector is more dominated by the freshwater. And if you talk about the outer channel, so outer channel has more brackish or saline conditions over there. So the, uh, the, um, the paleontological records which I'm sharing with you is collected to more towards from the northern sector. So this collection has been uh, done by uh, the Professor Berkaska from Germany and by a very uh, hard work, we, we were able to collect the samples because it's very, as you know, that it becomes very difficult to collect the samples from the lake and lag within the lake and the lagoon. Uh, from the adjacent area, it's very 
uh, not that much difficult, but from the, within the lagoon, it makes very, very, um, it requires very hard work and a lot of uh, other things are required to take up this kind of studies. So luckily we got the dates up to the 12,000 years before present. And uh, the study, the paleo uh, paleontological studies, which we have taken up from this area, tells about that the, during the LCM time period, the sea level has did not reach the area. And this area was under the fluvial influence. And during our studies, we found the two phases of mangrove development. And that is between the 10,000 to 8,000 years before present and it, between 8,000 to 5,000 years before present. And uh, especially when the development of uh, mangroves was taking place or the abundance of mangrove forests have been reported in the past, which indicates the initiation of the warming phase. And that started near about 10,000 years before present. And as I told that, the diversification of the mangrove started between eight to 5,000 years before present, which shows the stabilization condition or the stabilized conditions of the marine freshwater environment. And again, this rich mangrove vegetation, especially in the Chilka Lagoon, started deteriorating after 5,000 years before present. That might be due to the relative sea level fall. And the major changes which we found that is around the 2,000 years before present, the mangrove started uh, disappearing from this area. And presently, you can see that uh, we found very scattered patches, patches of the mangroves and most of them are uh, planted mangroves, not the natural mangroves over there. So one publication is available uh, of late Holocene time period that was published in Quaternary International from the Chipka Lagoon itself. And uh, after this, I would uh, like to take you to the undermines. As you know, working on the paleoecological or the paleontological records, it becomes very difficult to work in the uh, mangroves areas because uh, uh, as, you, as everybody knows that the Sundarbans, Mr. Royal Bengal Tiger, he is very dangerous. So he doesn't allow the paleoecologists to work over there. And most of the ecologists also might be facing the same problem. And if we talk about the Pithakarnika and the Andaman areas, so here the, there is no fear of the Royal Bengal tiger, but we have to be very worried and we have to be careful from the crocodiles. So they, these are the few challenges which paleoecologists are facing in the Indian mangroves area. So with the, uh, under one of the fast track project, which was funded by the DST, I got an opportunity to work in the underbus and I had collected the 25 surface samples from the right new creek, which is very, very important mangrove dialect creek of South Andaman. And we did the paleoecological uh, and uh, geochemical studies from this area. And we found that this, the pollen from the local vegetation was more, more dominant. And whereas the regional vegetation surrounding the depositional site is poorly represented in the sediments. Similarly, pollen from mangroves are locally restricted and reflect the distribution of the source plants and mangrove types. Uh, in our studies, we have also taken care consideration of the environmental variables like pH, salinity, and temperature, DO. And the greatest concentration of the electronic flexa of evergreen, deciduous, and mountain components are derived from the surrounding lens. So I could say that this was the new information on the modern pollen assemblages and their relationship to the vegetation types and environmental conditions, which can be applied to other mangroves ecosystem of South and South East Asia regions to reconstruct paleo vegetation and paleoclimatic changes. And other than Andamans, we uh, have also worked in the Gulf of Kutch area and we are in the Saurashtra too. And presently I'm running one project also in both the areas. So uh, we have reported the Excuse process me, and application. Yeah, sure. It's, sorry to interrupt. Uh, do you have a lot more slides to cover? No, no, uh, hardly. We, we are already. Three. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. About can you wrap up, please? Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, sure. So these are the few publications which you can go through if you are interested. And uh, as I was talking about that, we uh, are more dealing with the pollen spores from the mangrove sediments. So these are the few images, which are beautiful images of the mangrove pollens. 
And these are the terrestrial pollen, which we recovered from the mangrove sediments. And these are the few spores. And there are certain marine elements, foraminifera, dinoflagellates, and few freshwater diatoms have also been reported from the entire uh, mangrove sediments of India regions. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pandey. And sorry for interrupting because I, I didn't realize how many slides you have. And <laughs> no, no issues, no issues. Yeah. So uh, thank you for taking us to the, the beautiful uh, world or, or historical world of, of mangroves. And it's important and pertinent to, to, to see what existed where, particularly when we are looking at uh, <clears throat> identifying areas and uh, to restore, rehabilitate, or to just know what was the mangrove extent where they existed. So knowing a little bit more about the history uh, can help us uh, in, uh, advance uh, or make decisions for future. So thank you. It's, it's very fascinating. I, I, I was very impressed with the, the, the pit or the, the trends that you showed in one of the picture with two, two people in there. We take soil cores and we, we pride ourselves by taking more than a meter deep core. And here you have a pit where two people are standing and sampling. So uh, that was very impressive to say the least. Um, so that brings us to the, the closure of our uh, three talks from panel members. Uh, we had hoped to have a, a sort of a longer discussion and, and, and conversation in this panel discussion. Uh, but I guess uh, this looks a little bit uh, uh, unlikely given where we are in terms of time and, and try to keep in program. But I think uh, what is important is that the, the, the information, the knowledge that has been shared, that the insight all these panel members have brought about uh, and, and speakers have brought about mangrove research, new, uh, new technologies, new techniques, new ways of understanding these ecosystems uh, in terms of uh, uh, advancement in, in the techniques, uh, in terms of uh, use of uh, new uh, uh, methods. Uh, for example, Dr. Behra talked about unoccupied uh, aerial vehicle, mobile apps. Uh, Dr. Richard uh, mentioned about using terrestrial LIDAR, RSET, and lead 210 in measuring sediment cores and whatnot. And Dr. Badri also discussed about long-term monitoring uh, and using eDNA techniques to understand them. These are fascinating new, new areas uh, of research. I really wish that we had a little more, uh, or someone, uh, a speaker who could talk about new areas in terms of socioeconomic understanding, because we, we discussed this extensively yesterday, uh, talking about how this is a, we have to look uh, at this ecosystem in a holistic manner, and you cannot extricate just the biophysical from socioeconomic. So such research advances needs to go in hand in hand. So, uh, which is interesting also, because uh, next speaker we have is uh, Dr. Farid, who, who sort of uh, uh, works in, in these similar areas. He has very impressive uh, publications and long research career. Uh, and he's here with us on a very interesting uh, new uh, topic. He's here to share some of the priority questions in future mangrove science and effective conservation. So I think, uh, I, I, I am hoping that uh, Professor Farid will try to bring this together in his uh, presentation next. So what we missed in, in sort of uh, discussion, I think Farid is going to cover single-handedly and we are very thankful for him to have us, uh, to, for him to be with us today. It's very early in, in Belgium where he's joining us, so we cannot be more thankful for him to making time for all three days and also answering questions, being engaged in conversations and everything. So thank you for it. A brief uh, uh, introduction for you. I, I think everyone here knows you and have uh, referred your work, so we are not new to you, but uh, just uh, for some new uh, early career researchers or researchers joining from India who may not have known much about you. Um, you are uh, working as a professor at the Free University of Brussels, and you have conducted research on mangrove in about uh, 20 countries during the last 30 years. You have published recent, uh, nearly about 200 peer-reviewed paper, guided 26 PhD students and more than 160 master's students. You are awarded eight international scientific awards for your research. 
And according to Web of Science, you are the second most productive mangrove researcher in general and the first when dealing with mangrove ethnobiology and socioecology. You are also founding and managing director of Tropimundo, a master's program that awards full scholarships to students from many developing countries to study tropical biodiversity and ecosystem. So this is particularly of note to our very young mangrove or budding mangrove researchers who may be interested to do PhD, they should get in touch with Farid. So with that, Farid, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think now the time is already better. It's seven o'clock, but some other people I saw, <laughs> it's 2 a.m. I saw some students from Canada. Richard is also falling asleep probably. <laughs> so respect for all those people that uh, are in other time zones of the, of the world. Let me uh, share my uh, screen. Um, can you see my screen in prison? Um, it's coming up, that? I believe. Yes, now it's good. Go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. I only have 15 slides, so I will make it short because it's yeah, it, it is actually very concrete. I'm not going to elaborate a lot on on uh, on research results. This is about the future, actually. Uh, this is a, a launch of of an ID. Uh, on behalf of a global initiative, so it's not only uh, myself and, and Minakshi, but it's a global initiative, and I will say in a moment who is involved and who will hopefully be involved in the future. Uh, it's about the priority questions uh, in future mangrove science and uh, effective conservation. And to tell you a little bit of what the initiative started from, I don't know how many amongst you are aware or uh, are familiar with MMM. It has been mentioned in some of the talks. Well, MMM. Uh, is yeah, it stands for the meeting on mangrove macrobentos or the meeting on mangrove management it has changed uh, um, m's over time but it's the only recurrent uh, conference in the world international conference uh, in the world that deals uh, with, with mangroves and uh, it has started in kenya in 2000 and went to australia 2006 i brought it to the indian subcontinent uh, myself in 2012 when we organized it in sri lanka uh, and then in 2016 in, in Florida, US, and uh, 2019 in, uh, in Singapore. So every time there is this major conference with uh, yeah, many uh, mangrove scientists in the world, there is also a workshop. And so this idea actually started from that post-conference workshop. And who is involved or who will hopefully be involved in the future? So for sure, uh, the, the, the members of that workshop are involved. And, with this presentation, I'm hoping to involve uh, you, but it will also involve uh, the members of the IUCN uh, Species Survival Commission and more specifically the Mangrove Special Specialist Group to which I belong. But we also have seen uh, Professor Katirazan, we have seen uh, Professor uh, Satya Narayana, so there, there are multiple people that, that are in that uh, Mangrove Specialist Group. Also, the participants of these countries, mangrove scientists in general, authors of peer reviewed papers. But then, more important, uh, global, regional, and local networks, local mangrove managers, and local policymakers. And the, the, I'm, I'm emphasizing the, the, the term uh, local. And um, the idea is that with the, 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 the data that we will collect, uh, we will present this um, future uh, mangrove research uh, results on uh, the MMM6, which will take place in Colombia in 2020. So there are actually six history lines that set the basis for, for this idea. So the first one has already been mentioned before also by, by another speaker. It's World Without Mangroves by, by Ducatel. That was actually, we wrote this actually in the, in the conference workshop of uh, um, 2006. So it was in Aust when the, the MMM took place in Australia. It was MMM. And that was a problematic signal, of course. Uh, it was just a letter um, but it was a problematic uh, ringing of the alarm bell um, 20 years later almost uh, uh, in, in, in Singapore we, we saw that the trends of decreasing mangrove surfaces they, they were better now they're not increasing yet but they're better now so we talked about conservation optimism in, in current biology last year with uh, Daniel Fries et al. Another history line is that of public perception. So mangroves are doing bad, but on top of that, very often uh, people 
start introducing mangroves by saying something bad. Uh, mangroves are very dangerous and uh, mangroves, uh, they're very muddy, they're full of mosquitoes, but then there are ecosystem services. That's not the way to go. That's not the way to go because uh, economic developers, all they hear is mangroves stink and mangroves are full of mosquitoes and that is used as, as a reason to convert mangroves even more. So we have to, um, to, to bring out the beauty uh, of mangroves because these public perceptions of what mangroves are, they really matter uh, in, in conservation. Third history line is that of failed restoration and rehabilitation initiatives. There have been many papers throughout uh, the, the last uh, 20 years that uh, highlighted restoration of mangroves, but restoration that was not scientifically underpinned. So restoration in areas of which we as scientists can say a priori that they're not going to survive. But that's also another important thing that we have to go towards restoration in areas where they can actually uh, Another history line is that of a degradation uh, of mangroves and how you conceptualize that. Also today, there was a, a mention uh, to, to these indicators that, that we can use. There is another one that we just published, again, an outcome from the MMM5 workshop uh, by Yando et al, in which we try to, um, to, to use indicators and, and real yeah, sources and, and references that can uh, help you to estimate whether a mangrove is doing good or bad or, or uh, average. And then uh, one more study line is again uh, about restoration uh, activities. Uh, we've seen that in some areas, actually the environmental conditions change. I think uh, Dr. Nero is, is, is uh, one of the pioneers in, in showing that the Andaman Islands has up, been uplifted on one side and then it was uh, 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 subsided at the other side. And so the, the environmental conditions in which mangroves were, they have changed. <clears throat> We, 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 call, we call this shifted baselines, basically. There is also a paper from, from myself, from uh, Kanichi, that emphasized that these shifted baselines are very important because there is no point in trying to restore mangroves in areas that have changed environmental conditions so much that you cannot uh, host mangroves there uh, anymore. And another important point is that um, you, can, you can plant mangroves, but a mangrove, if you look at the definition of Mukherjee et al. in 2014, is not just the trees. Huh? So counting trees and looking at density <clears throat> to establish how much how successfully your replantation was, that's uh, not a good uh, indicator. <clears throat> in fact, there is a lot of fauna and crabs, you cannot plant them. Snails, you cannot plant them. These microbiota uh, uh, that has just been um, uh, referred to in the previous um, presentations. You cannot replant that. They have to come by themselves unless they're already present before plantation, but that's often not the case. And so finally, the, the current and future um, view of mangrove is still that, that it, is, it is continuing to degrade. Not as bad as 20 years ago, uh, but, but still. So what do we want to do? What is the objective of, the, of these global initiatives? We want to identify the future scientific curiosity driven on one hand, and on the other side, the managerial need driven questions to which science management and or governance needs an answer. And I can come up with 101 different interesting scientific questions in my little office in Belgium, 4,000 kilometers away from the nearest mangrove, but is that what the local people are waiting for? Is that what the local scientists, the local managers, the local policymakers are waiting for. And I think we have to go towards researching what they need an answer on. And so that's why we organize this very inclusive um, yeah, um, study, actually, in which we invite you all to, to, to participate. Um, we want to execute this uh, in the remaining days of 21 and, uh, and 22. And as I said, we want to have it published and presented, especially shared uh, with the world uh, through MMM6. In, uh, so how can you help in this is participating in this online survey. And it's very easy. There's only two questions. It's, uh, there's a number of sub questions, but there are basically two questions. And more importantly, um, bring this to your mangrove managers and bring this to your local policy makers in all your countries. You're not only talking about India, but uh, about 126 countries 
uh, in which mangroves are, uh, are found. And basically, the two questions are very easy. In your opinion, what are the most important questions to which mangrove science needs an answer? On the other hand, to what mangrove management needs uh, an answer? And for each of these questions, we are interested to know which country you're talking about at the station scale and which time period you, you want to see these questions uh, asked. And the survey basically ends with a few questions about your professional uh, experience. How long have you been working on the mangrove? Because we want to have an idea who is answering these questions. But it's completely anonymous. So what is the, the place where you can find the survey? Um, the one in blue is uh, currently uh, unavailable, but it will be the future link where you can find this survey. But uh, otherwise, uh, in the chat window, I um, mean, actually, we'll post the, the long one. It's, of course, uh, impractical to start copying it from the screen. Uh, so it will be in a link in, in the chat window, but that's the, the place where the, the shared Google form is actually uh, posted. And so if you have uh, any questions about it, you can contact uh, either one of us. Uh, and I want to uh, end my, my call because it's also uh, quite quite important. You mentioned the, the, the managing uh, function in Tropimundo. Uh, Tropimundo is, a, is an international uh, master degree in which we have lots of scholarships, fully paid scholarships uh, from any uh, country in, in for students from any country in the world, and the call is open, so I want to emphasize this. Uh, just go to tropimundo.org. So that's my short contribution. So I hope with this talk, I can invite you to think about where science and uh, needs to go in the future, uh, and about which questions we really need to answer locally. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Farid. Thank you for taking us uh, to the journey of uh, the mangrove conferences. Uh, through time and how this also sort of indicates uh, over time the interest in mangroves have grown and, and the role these kind of scientific conferences have played in, in, in communicating science, in, in making, uh, you know, shedding light on the important uh, challenges that we have through publications, through engagement through uh, uh, discourses like this. And I'm pretty sure people who are attending here will not only participate in your survey themselves, but also as you ask them, they will take it to their own mangrove managers, researchers, policy makers, so we can have a wider cast net uh, of, uh, uh, of people uh, bringing the information which is locally relevant, which is, as you rightly pointed out, very much needed. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I have a pleasure to, to close this session. And we will move on to our uh, next uh, uh, program item, which is a concluding remarks, which will be provided by Dr. Nehru Prabhakaran. But before I hand over to Dr. Nehru Prabhakaran, uh, I see uh, Professor Kathiration has raised a hand. Uh, 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 yes. Please go uh, ahead. You know, mangrove bioprospecting is an important area of research because mangroves are traditionally used as medicine for years together, decades together. So what is required is scientific validation for the traditional knowledge on the medicinal value of mangroves. We have done a lot of pioneering work and the mangroves uh, uh, have tremendous potential to control the viruses. So this is the need of the hour. We need more work on the medicinal aspects of mangroves or bioprospecting of mangroves. Thank you, Rupesh. Thank you, Professor Kathiration. Yes, indeed. Um, thank you for bringing this out. I think we, we didn't uh, talk about this aspect, but as we, it's really difficult to capture the entire, you know, diversity of topics and, and, uh, and these uh, important points in a relatively small period of, of you know, three small online uh, webinars or three days of uh, uh, the short webinars but i think we did uh, hi, uh, all of us do recognize that the vast um, opportunity as well as some of the gaps that we that needs to be addressed and i think we we all uh, mangrove researchers mangrove uh, lovers 
um, will uh, move from this point uh, with much more energy, much more enthusiasm, with much more ideas. Uh, so with that, I will uh, pass on to uh, Dr. Nehru to give the wrapping remarks uh, for today or concluding remarks for today. And uh, uh, I also like to mention that at this point in the chat box, you will see a link. Uh, this is for all participants that they will see a link to complete a survey for this uh, workshop. So please uh, click that link and complete this before you uh, 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 close this uh, meeting. So over to you, Nehru. Thank you, Rupesh. Uh, so it's, it's, it's been a roller coaster ride for the last three days and we had interesting session and uh, it's really, really difficult to you know, conclude it in a five minute session. So uh, I, but I try my best to cover uh, all the bases. Um, so how it started, in fact, uh, this the conference, uh, I think uh, some six months ago, only me and uh, Rupesh, we ever had our first chat. And then um, then for some time, we, we hadn't had any discussions. And then some three months ago, we, we came together to discuss our various activities. And then given this uh, pandemic situation. So we were just discussing how we can go about things. And we already had this idea of, you know, both of us had this idea of having a regional, uh, you know, conference on mangrove where we can get to, you know, a collaborative effort of, you know, putting many people who are working in Indian subcontinent on mangroves together in a one platform to share their knowledge and which can eventually take us to the next level. Like I mentioned in my presentation, Building bridges for collaborative research is one of the major um, major uh, focus of this uh, workshop. I I'm really really uh, hopeful that uh, in in future this the, the some of the uh, panel panel members or some of the speakers and the participants will come forward for more collaborative research. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, when we did, uh, when we you know started talking about this conference. Uh, the first first uh, interesting point uh, when uh, Dr. Shivakumar, uh, one of the uh, welcome address speakers, uh, mentioned to me when I floated this idea, he said, "Make sure you uh, try to include include people of various backgrounds, like academicians, researchers, scientists, and especially policymakers and NGOs." So uh, that was a wonderful idea because that kind of uh, provides a holistic. Uh, uh, holistic way of taking things forward. Otherwise, it, if it is just a researchers, then it stays with the researchers, right? So it's a better way. We try to inc include as many diversity in, the, in terms of speakers is concerned. So uh, we were very glad that we, we, we managed at least to some proportion to uh, achieve that. And on the whole, we had uh, uh, 19 uh, resource persons from uh, 19 uh, institutions from uh, resource persons of 19 institutions of which 12 from India and seven institutions, seven uh, institutional representations from abroad. And uh, also uh, the number of participants over the days were very, very encouraging. We had almost more than 400, around 400 uh, registrations for each day event. And that was really, uh, we haven't really expected such a high number of registrations also. Every day we had around 200 participations uh, for a, uh, that again, some of the, uh, one of the encouraging thing. And most importantly, we had, partic we had uh, participations from more than 30 countries and being a regional conference and, uh, and that's the, you know, uh, advantage this online platforms provide us. Suddenly we had some 30, more than 30 country participants attending this conference, that means we are very hopeful that it will uh, lead to a very good outcomes in the, in the future. And uh, we had three different uh, days and three different th themes. Each day had a panel discussion, each day had a keynote address, and each day had a two talks of, of the, the contemporary research. And all the sessions were wonderful and uh, many, 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 uh, uh, we, we are very thankful to all the speakers, especially many people had made their effort to answer uh, a lot of questions in the chat box itself uh, because of the time time constraint. Many uh, speakers managed their uh, answers and we are very glad that. And uh, last but not least, 
this conference was started and th this webinar was started with the aim to uh, bring uh, mangrove researchers together as to, uh, especially who are working within indian subcontinent and um, we hope that this will uh, build bridges for future collaborative uh, projects and uh, future collaborations and also uh, this may even be a starting point for a better uh, such uh, events in the future. Uh, with that, I hand over to Rupesh. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. For the yeah. Thanks a lot. And uh, yes, it is indeed a great, great pleasure to hear uh, the far uh, reach of this event and so many people joined from so many places. Uh, and the amount of information, insights, knowledge shared is impressive. And, and we, we do hope that this will lead to further more impactful research, more communication, and more knowledge sharing of uh, mangroves, about mangroves. So with that, uh, uh, we have our uh, last but not least, we have Minakshi Poti so to give a vote of thanks, a formal uh, thank you vote and uh, uh, close the session. Um, just a brief introduction about Minakshi. She is a <coughs> Indian PhD researcher from uh, University Libre de Bruxelles. Sorry if I'm not uh, pronounce it, pronouncing it correctly. Uh, she is based in Be Belgium uh, and her studies uh, include response to environment change in small tropical islands in the Indian Ocean, which is Western Indian uh, Ocean Islands, on-site work in Andaman and Nicobar Islands in India. Her research interests include ocean and coastal governance, mangrove and island social ecological system, adaptation to environmental change, and participatory, uh, using participatory research methods. Uh, she uses watercolor art and creative writing to communicate science and policy to wider audience. And she's also one among uh, three organizing student organizing members of this conference. So I uh, request Minakshi to give a vote of thanks and close the event. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rupesh. Um, and it's a, it's a great pleasure to have been attending this three-day knowledge journey with uh, all the participants and the speakers from not only India, but also from around the globe. Um, and like it was said earlier, this event comes probably once in a blue moon and is a one of a kind event uh, because at least in my experience, I haven't attended such an expert um, driven focused workshop or webinar on mangroves especially. So it's, uh, it, it feels wonderful to be together with uh, fellow mangrove lovers. Um, and through this three day learning journey, we we saw that um, there's a lot of potential and promising opportunities for mangrove research and conservation um, in the Indian subcontinent, but also beyond. Um, so, but to firstly start thanking uh, the partners of this workshop, um, which is C4 ECRAF, the Wildlife Institute of India and USAID uh, for providing both um, organizational support but also the funding for um, this three-day webinar. Um, and a special thank you to the invited guests, speakers, and panel members uh, who are joining us from different time zones and for patiently um, uh, contributing and sharing their knowledge, uh, not only through their presentations, but also in answering the questions. Um, and of course, the participants, the the large number of participants who've come together and made time to listen, discuss, and ask critical questions. Uh, it was especially delightful to, to see the exchange and the, the questions that were coming in through the question and answer uh, box. Um, and in terms of organization, uh, I would really like to thank uh, Kania Rahayu uh, for the coordination and communication with all the speakers um, and this had, this had a really positive impact in terms of smooth execution of the program. Uh, and also to the C4 communications team for developing promotional material and promoting the work workshop online, which is probably how most of you found out about it. Um, and then the C4 IT team for preparing the web page, 
setting up the Zoom sessions. And especially in this day and age where everything is running online, uh, this, uh, this proved this, their help was uh, essential in the effortless running of the sessions. Um, and then also the other organization committee volunteers, uh, Anu Prad Singh and Tirumurugan, um, for helping coordinate and plan the event. Um, and of course, um, this, this event would have not been possible without the support and encouragement of Dr. Robert Nasi of C4 and Dr. Dhananjay Mohan of WII. Um, and last, but definitely not the least, a huge thank you, uh, probably not just from me, but from all the participants and the speakers for bringing us together uh, to Dr. Rupesh Bhomia and Dr. Nehru Prabhakaran for being the brains uh, behind this workshop. Because uh, if not for you, uh, then we wouldn't have got to learn and exchange all this vital knowledge. Um, and finally, uh, I hope this workshop has left you uh, stimulated for further research and engagement with mangrove science. Um, and I hope it translates into collective thinking and action, both in terms of collaboration, but also policy and policy implementation on ground in uh, India and beyond as well. Uh, so thank you very much. And please uh, don't forget to fill in the, the feedback survey. Thank you. Thank you, Minakshi. Thanks a lot. Thank and indeed, it, it is a joint effort. It would not have been possible the way it was without contribution, each and every one from uh, top to bottom. So we are extremely delighted that this could take place and uh, how many people it has reached. Uh, the presentation and video recording of the sessions will be posted in about uh, a week's time at the conference web page so if you have missed any session or if you want to revisit please feel free to visit the website and once again i'd like to request all uh, participants to fill up the survey form we will also email uh, you the survey link just in case if you can't do it right away today but uh, that will help us in planning and do even a better job next time so with that, uh, uh, on behalf of Nehru and myself, uh, I thank you and uh, call this meeting to a close. Thanks a lot.